Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us in today's uh, MIDI conference. We don't officially go live for another two and a half minutes or so. Um, so uh, we start bang on two o'clock, but we'd like to start a few seconds early just so that people have a chance to make sure everything's working okay and the stream is good. Uh, so I can see we've got a few people uh, coming in as we speak. Hello, Alan. It's uh, uh, lovely seeing you. And um, I think hopefully we've got Renato joining us fairly soon and a few others. So Miro, while we're just waiting for people just to check in, um, how is it uh, in Lockdown City, which unfortunately is joined by the whole of the UK pretty well now? <laughs> I haven't had time to absorb it really and um, realise what's changed. What's changed for me personally? Nothing really. No. Um, we can still get a takeaway. We can still go for a walk. So, yeah, life is pretty much yeah, the same. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, that's that's something. Obviously, it must be the Liverpool air that's uh, doing it uh, for you. So, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I can see a few more people log in as we speak. Uh, so do introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, we'd love to uh, to engage with everyone through the live stream and the other way around. And uh, uh, I've cheated with a virtual background behind me. Miro has actually got a real background, which is her wallpaper in her living room, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so we'll be getting started another minute or so. So those. Rupert, who... Do you want to mention about Facebook users? Giving ah. us their names. Ah, uh, yes. Um, if any of you are joining us from the members group, the community group, um, it doesn't actually come up with people's names in our stream, so we don't know who you are. Uh, but we'll try and keep a lookout on it for that. Hopefully, most of us have joined by either Facebook page or via uh, YouTube, so it won't be uh, a problem. Just give me a moment. Um, Lyric, nice to see you as well. Um, uh, have, have you fooled? What, my background? I don't think so, Alan. You probably didn't really believe I was in uh, Greenwich Park uh, today somehow, but uh, there we go. Um, just give me a second, because I've got a camera obscuring my view here, so I can't see what you're seeing. Right, so. And Richard's but, joined us. Hello, Richard. Yeah, good. Welcome, Richard. Nice to see you. We haven't spoken for ages, so I hope you're keeping well. And... Uh, yeah, so, um, I, I, Alan, whereabouts are you from, as a matter of interest? Uh, and Lyric, it sounds like a slight... Uh, where are you from, at Lyric? We'd be really interested to know. Just tell us uh, tell us where you're from. It'd be really interesting. OK, we can see a few more people coming in. Those of you who are joining us right now, if you could very kindly introduce yourselves in the chat, that'd be absolutely brilliant. Uh, the way these things tend to work um, when you're live streaming is we tend to find that people will join us in the first five, ten minutes or so, um, but it's nice to always welcome people on board. So, uh, David, welcome. Uh, it's nice to uh, see you. So I haven't spoken to you since uh, before Christmas. Hope you've had a, a good one. And Lyric, you're from Nigeria. Brilliant. Um, and the second person is actually Mural pretending to be me because we're having to share the, uh, the login. So um, who else have we got here as we speak? Um, okay. Right, so I think what we'll do is we'll get started because it is uh, two o'clock now and um, uh, I'll just share my screen and I can find the right button. There we go. So today's uh, mini conference is really a really good way of kicking everyone off um, for 2021. What a turbulent year it's been so far and we're only in sort of day four, day five of the new year. And look what's happening. I can see Tom's joined us from Cyprus this afternoon. A uh, uh, bit of a nightmare greeting from Cyprus. I don't know what's going on in Cyprus, Tom. Uh, presumably you haven't got full lockdown over there like we have in the UK, but no doubt you'll tell us. Uh, hello, Daniel. Uh, nice to see you You're online again today. So absolutely brilliant. So those, those of you who are joining us, do introduce yourselves in the chat. It'd be lovely to see you. And we'll... Um, Let's just get started a little bit, and then we'll have to do a little bit more on the way of introductions in just a moment or two. So uh, the mini conference is really a really good way of getting kickstarting the whole part of uh, 2021. Clearly, we're in a very fast-moving world at the moment. It doesn't seem to have slowed down. It is about bringing sales forward, um, helping you or showing you how to amplify your brand and how you can get your time back. Uh, so that's the theme of today's uh, conference. Um, so hopefully you will get uh, lots from it. Uh, so in terms of what we're going to be covering uh, next is we're just going to be looking a little bit at what's in the news. Uh, I actually created the slide several days ago and it's already out of date. Uh, but anyway, the good news on the positive side 
is that we have obviously got the two new vaccines that are being rolled out as we speak. And uh, the other part, um, which uh, probably much to everyone's surprise, uh, our friend Boris somehow managed to pull off his oven ready deal for Christmas. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's obviously by a wig and a prayer, but he just about managed to do it. Um, so at least as the point the reason I'm making this is that at least one area of uncertainty has been removed because what one of the things that people hate is uncertainty. Now we notice this a, a lot that if there's uncertainty, people will quite often postpone making decisions. Well, at least now we know where we stand. Whether your opinion was for or against um, uh, Brexit, as it were, at least we know where we, we are, and in which case we can move forward. And one thing for sure is 2021 is going to be very much a year like no other. And it's also going to be a period of time when the dinosaurs of industry will decline. And it really is going to be the ascent of those that adapt, change and innovate. So um, I don't mean it quite in the way that it sounds, but let's just put a bit of context on it. Excuse me a second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, so what I mean by that is that obviously before COVID came along, there was a, a general decline in the high street anyway, because a lot of people were moving online. What it's tended to do is to accelerate the move to online transactions. So something that might have taken five or 10 years to do has really happened over 12 months or even less. <coughs> Sorry about that. Now, obviously, we can see examples where People haven't adapted and changed very well. You'll need to look at Topshop and uh, the, these other brands around that where, they, to be honest, they've got really no excuse because they've certainly got the money and the resources to be able to repackage what they were doing to suit the online world. I know we're in that space to a degree. Um, but they, they ha fundamentally, they haven't really adapted uh, fast enough. Now, obviously, there are other examples where uh, uh, businesses have really adapted and changed and moved on. And of course, it's really about coming with a fresh uh, mindset with all of this. So what I wanted to really just touch on is um, it, the left-hand shot is very much uh, the situation it was in Italy, ironically enough, in March of last year. And we got a touch of deja vu because, of course, now we've got a full lockdown in the UK. Um, and this is a friend of mine called Alex, who used to work for us. He's doing a little bit of work behind the scenes for us still now. And this is when he was traveling back uh, from Spain, sorry, from Italy last year. And as you can see there, the plane was sort of, well, over three quarters empty. Um, obviously, the airline industry has had to do go through massive change, um, presumably helped a lot by government support, but invariably that won't be enough. But look at other sectors which have done very well. So clearly Amazon, as you would expect, is uh, thriving in this current situation. Uh, the other online players like Google, uh, Microsoft, they're greatly benefiting from the situation. Um, companies like Zoom as well, look how well they're doing uh, out of this. But there are a few surprises as well. So let's look at a few other examples. If uh, a business is selling garden houses, sorry, summer houses or, or very large garden sheds, a lot of people are actually deciding to actually create some extra space, perhaps away from the sort of family household where they just can't work uh, properly. And uh, apparently sales in that particular space have gone through the roof because people want uh, somewhere else to be able to work from a home environment. Um, look at people selling bathtubs. Uh, if people are in the DIY space, um, you know, or landscaping, uh, all these type of things, th those type of businesses are tending to very, very much benefit from the new world uh, order uh, that we're actually in. So it's just worth thinking about that. The reason I'm sowing those seeds is that um, really it is about adapting and change and responding to the market as we know it. And uh, as Seth Godin said, now this is not a recent quote, uh, this was uh, written about three or four years ago, but fundamentally for those who do adapt and change, it can be a real opportunity as well. And this is the real uh, thought process behind here today. It is really about encouraging you to think out of the box and see what can come from here. So what do we plan today? Now, um, in general terms, we will be talking about bringing your sales forward, how you can amplify your brand and uh, basically do the job once and ben benefit by uh, leveraging that multiple times, as it were. And uh, we'll also be explaining a lot more about how you can leverage technology uh, to give you your time back. And we've got some solutions in the box which can help you with that. And as part of this, 
we'll also be discussing your ideal uh, marketing and product mix, how to maximize sales through LinkedIn, and we'll give you some top tips on that, and why BizGrowth Time Machine will transform your business. It's a complete solution and box which enables you to do all, all the heavy lifting for you and agree an action plan uh, with you. And also, we've just created a new diagnostic tool as well, which I'm really dying to, uh, uh, to see you use um, as part of the session today. Um, and it's a way of giving back massive value. But also, if we do have a follow-on conversation, you will get lots out of it as well. So um, who's this for? It's very much the CEOs and leaders who want business growth. Uh, it is for those who are open-minded, um, it's leaders who value their time and are very aspirational in terms of what they want to achieve. Uh, we are going to be giving away some Amazon vouchers uh, today. Um, so at the very end, when uh, you have a chance to complete the new sales and marketing diagnostic, um, there'll be some prizes from that, but I may, we may have probably one or two others on the way throughout uh, this presentation. Now, I know we've got a number of clients as well on this call, so welcome to those of you who are already existing clients. Now, if you are existing clients, some of this you'll be familiar with because uh, we've been through it before, uh, but hopefully we'll get some insights um, and uh, we'll be able to go from there. Now, who this isn't for, it's not for those who uh, don't value their time or believe that Albert Einstein was wrong, okay? I think we all fall into this trap sometimes, uh, me included, that it's very easy to, um, it's very easy to get stuck almost on the treadmill and uh, we can almost be so uh, overwhelmed with what's actually sort of going on. We don't think clearly. And of course, that impacts the success of our, our business. Um, so what I would ask you to do as well is please do introduce yourself in the chat and what you are really passionate about. Um, if you could avoid putting web links or promotional links in there, because this is about sharing uh, genuine value. We want to create a real sense of community uh, through these sessions. Um, indicate what you'd like out of today. Be bold with your questions um, because we love those. Um, and we've got a couple of uh, uh, people joining us on the live stream today. We've got a gentleman called Paul who's joining us. Uh, he's got quite an interesting story to tell. Another one called Raymond's a bit later on uh, too. So uh, Paul and Raymond, by the way, if you're on this live stream already, if you could introduce yourselves in the chat so we know you're there, that'd be really appreciated. Um, uh, so do do, re, do, do engage, do, don't sit in the background because that way everyone benefits by knowing you're there and there's a way that uh, we can get the conversation uh, really going. Um, as a bonus session, uh, well, we'll give you a reminder of this a bit later on, actually, so you don't need to write this down. But on Thursday, I've, we've got our uh, every, every Thursday as a way of giving back to our community. Uh, in March last year, we made the decision when COVID first came along. It was a it was really important that we thought about our clients and how we could help and support them and also people who aren't clients yet. So it's a genuine way of giving back. So we started these weekly live streams in association with uh, Chris Cooper, um, who's a personal friend of mine. And, um, and I get interested enough, met him through LinkedIn to start with. Um, and uh, what's happened, that's proved really successful. So we've now been continuing this every week since. I think we're on episode 39 this week. Um, and Ian Randall is going to be talking about uh, if you're suffering with overwhelm, make 2021 the year for your growth. Um, and also there'll be uh, some insight discovery sessions you want to explore. And next week, we've got a double session. We've got uh, a networking collaboration session followed by a live stream. And we've also got another very special guest for you. So I'll give you more details on that uh, near the end of today. Um, we will have a natural break. Um, if to expect you to sit uh, for three and a half hours and not have a break is unrealistic. Um, we would ask you uh, to close down any other tabs you've got on your computer, including any email tabs, because this can interfere uh, with the what you're watching and what you're joining in on. Um, and uh, if there is, we do. If we do have a situation where multiple winners for perhaps uh, the main prize at the end, then we may have to go to a tiebreaker one, which may be drawn today, but it may be drawn on Thursday. So just bear that in mind. Um, so, and uh, just to re-emphasize what today is about, is about helping you to bring your sales forward. A lot of that be through LinkedIn, um, how to amplify your brand and get your time back. So um, on the bring your sales forward part of it, um, some of you who've are, uh, who are clients on the call today will be familiar with this. 
but what we talk about is using the uh, social selling blueprint, which is what we class as uh, lead generation, prospect nurturing, and sales optimization. And if any three of those cogs are not turning, uh, then of course it stops the whole process working. Um, now, clearly, um, if you've got nothing coming at the top, then you, there's no way, there's no conversations to nurture, uh, or no prospects to nurture, and of course that stops the sales process. If you are really poor on following through, um, then invariably it doesn't matter if you've got top cogs one and two turning as fast as they can, but you, you're never going to solve your problem. So what we're very keen to do is to work with clients to help them to get get all three of those turning. And in terms of the prospect nurturing process, we'll go into this a bit more detail a bit later on, but especially in the LinkedIn segment. Um, it's really important you adopt a, a, a five-message uh, process. Um, it, and it's not about overtly selling. Um, it's about building on the engagement side, but a very targeted, very personal way. So if you can do that and create a predictable, you can create a repeatable, predictable system, which will give you sales consistently month in, month out. Um, so I'm just going to move this out of the way a bit because I can't see what's actually going on on my screen. Um, yes, yeah, so so just uh, just give that some thought because that's what you really need to have in place if you haven't got it already. The Amplify Your Brand part, now to give you a bit more meat on the bone on that, um, what we'd urge you to do is to think much more strategically over your uh, the way that you actually put material out there. So... With this, it's about, think about how you can create a piece of content just once. Now, it could be a video live stream, a bit like we're doing today. Um, it could be you've recorded a really good interview or you've been uh, done some form of public talk and it's a very good piece, which really demonstrates your competence and expertise. Um, but if you've got some really good content to start with, how can you take that and repurpose that? So in addition to it being live streamed over the social channels, how can you then edit that down so that it was suddenly a bit more condensed and then rebroadcast uh, that content perhaps a couple of weeks later? How you can then go a stage further and say take a podcast um, and uh, use the different channels to get your podcast out there through uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, uh, Spotify, and Alexa and so on. And then what can you do with social media to leverage that exposure um, whether it's by that one piece of content or by breaking into multiple parts. Um, also, how you can look at running online events as part of your overall attraction strategy, what you can put in place around webinars and automated webinars. Uh, web automated webinars, if it's done authentically, uh, can be a really good way of leveraging your time. Uh, and you'll notice I did use the word authentically there. One of the things that we describe it as was an on-demand webinar or a just-in-time webinar. Uh, because, so because the automated, a lot of people try and pretend an automated webinar is real, okay? Uh, but actually, quite often it's not. I think it's about being authentic, but you can create a, a, like a live experience with the whole thing. Um, and then it's about taking that content again and saying, okay, well, let's get that transcribed. Um, and that's then created those posts and articles which you can put out there what you can put in place to, to design a diagnostic scorecard, um, a bit like something will take you through today. So you'll probably get some ideas from that. So when you complete it, um, you, you'll see the power of what's available in the toolbox. And if you're in the coaching mentoring space or you're in the, um, a space where it's valuable sharing other content, what, how you, can you take what you've produced uh, to create perhaps more of a membership portal or an e-learning portal on the top of that. And that's this is what we class as sort of really amplifying your brand. And the good thing is with a lot of this, yes, you may need to pay for some third-party services, but to still get good results, you don't necessarily need to spend money on pay-per-click with Facebook, YouTube, and the rest. Because that can be very expensive. Obviously, if you can do that, that's always a good thing to do. But we're very much a great advocate. If, if you can, we can show you how and give you the tools, it's much better you put yourself in control with that so you don't have to spend the money on it uh, and everything else around that and then give back your time get back your time is uh, by leveraging our systems technology we'll talk about this a bit more later on but in particular we've got literally a solution a box uh, which is our business growth time machine and basically it is a way of running campaigns almost i don't like the word autopilot because it suggests 
there's the lack of human interaction. Um, but the bottom line is you can take a job which takes three to five hours a day if you're doing it manually. Um, I promise you I'm not exaggerating there. Uh, you can reduce that to about 15 to 30 minutes, depending on uh, how organised you actually are. So um, then as in terms of... Uh, uh, we want you to be involved, uh, so do get involved in the chat. And uh, what we'll just do for a moment is we'll just have a, a quick break. So we'd like to have a look at some of the uh, feedback and the comments. Uh, so, Mural, are there, are there a few if, if comments or feedback you'd like to share? Has anything anyone sort of raised anything particularly which would, is a good point to flag up? Uh, no, um, Lyric, I think, was a, a little bit confused. He thought we deal with um, music artists and, and record labels. Um, so I've explained about that. No, everyone's been very quiet and just wishing everybody else a very happy new year, which, of course, we do to everybody. And um, let's hope it is a happy new year. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll make make sure it is. Uh, we're amongst a positive, uh, energetic group of people here today, so uh, let's make it lots of fun. Um, so I can see a few names that I recognise. Uh, Paul, welcome. Um, OK, he's absolutely delighted to be able to join us today. Um, and uh, we'll, we think we've got a special link for you a bit later on, Paul, so we'll come to that. Uh, who else we got? Tom, uh, welcome. Um, what I'm not sure on is actually is what you were talking about earlier on in terms of um, uh, down in um, the way you are, whether there's some particular issues where you are, but no doubt you will let us know. And Raymond, does that delighted you with us as well today. Um, you very kindly vol been volunteered to take part uh, a bit later on, so um, we'll share a link with you a bit later on. And uh, Alan, uh, great uh, that you're listening hard, so uh, appreciate it. So in which case, I think what we'll do is we'll keep this moving. We will have a natural break, as I say, around about 3, 3.15 for about uh, about 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, that just it gives you everyone a chance to get a cup of coffee and whatever, and we'll come back again. But that's a little way off just yet. So moving on from there, a little bit of an introduction from me and from Muriel. Um, so I'm a... Very fortunate, married to lovely, my lovely wife called Wendy. That's our son who, unfortunately, he's rather good at playing chess, which is very irritating because I used to beat him more or less every time, or perhaps I'd let him win every now and again. <laughs> but, of course, it's the other way around <laughs> and now. So, um, And that's our dog called uh, Gus. He's a 10-month-old uh, uh, Hungarian white visual. Uh, a little bit of a monster, but wouldn't be without him. He lit Definitely makes us laugh over something every day. Mira, well, how about you? Do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Yes, this is uh, me and my husband, John, and my three boys down below, um, one of which lives very close to us. One lives in Ibiza and one lives down south. Um, I'm, of course, a proud mum. Uh, they're, they're wonderful boys, but, uh, yeah, lovely family. Yeah, no, lovely. Well, thanks for that, Mira. And I will just... Uh, uh, pay a bit more of a compliment there because I, I think I've said this before that uh, every business needs a mural. Mural is the right hand person that makes sure everything happens. Um, where perhaps I miss something, Mural always manages to make sure it happens and things are done properly. Um, John is pretending to be a James Bond there. Um, I'm not sure we'd quite fall for that one just yet, but uh, I'm certainly very impressed. And a little bit more about, about your sons, if that's right, Mural as well, because I'm um, I think what's great about your sons is that they're all in their own way uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I think it's fair to say that Simon runs his, uh, along with his business partner, Jim, doesn't he? And obviously he's had to adapt and change to the situation that uh, we find ourselves in now. Um, uh, Daniel is in a very, been very smart and his business is pretty uh, resilient to what's going on at the moment, isn't it? Because he's, his business isn't really affected by COVID particularly, rather than being in a positive way in terms of, the work that he does, is that fair, Mural, to say? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct, yeah. yeah. So do you want to tell us a bit what Daniel does, my address? Well, Daniel deals with property maintenance. So um, he works for some estate agents. And as and when somebody moves out of a property, whatever it needs doing, Daniel um, does it or arranges um, to have it done by his, his uh, staff or his contractors. Um, he's also now, Rupert, I don't, I'm not sure if you know, uh, just bought a second property. So he's now a very small time property developer, <laughs> um, something he's been wanting to do for years. And he's uh, he's just bought his second property. So fingers right. crossed all goes well there. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, we perhaps have got a, a budding Marco Robinson there for those who were on the live stream a few <laughs> weeks ago. Uh, and the guy on the right, uh, Johnny, um, he used to have a reptile when he was much younger. 
I seem to remember that reptile as well. I think he's decided to take on the characteristics of that reptile by his lovely tattoos, uh, but he's very entrepreneurial himself as he's got a business in Ibiza as well, isn't he? So, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So the reason I just touch on that actually is a human interest type thing, but it's also goes to show that by being smart and innovating, you can stay ahead uh, despite uh, the adversity of everything that's sort of going on. Um, so a very quick interest from a business point of view. Um, uh, I uh, Well, so let's go back a tiny bit. Um, I've personally been, I suppose, in business in different shapes sort of the last 25 years or so, and that's uh, giving away my age and probably a bit more beyond. Um, I've not always got things right. I'd love to think I had, but I haven't. Um, I suppose one of the things that uh, I was particularly proud of some time ago is that I did manage to create an organisation which from one person to, grew to 65 people over four years. Uh, I think we reached a turn of about £3 million. Pounds. I got widespread national TV and national press coverage. Uh, and we, over about a four-year period, managed to attract 160,000 members and also six major uh, insurance partnerships. And we had about 3,000 active introducers. And um, uh, we did have a slight problem. Unfortunately, we made the mistake of growing too fast. Um, and we, it was literal, uh, literal, uh, exponent, continued exponential growth. Uh, Mira was uh, with me then. She was acting uh, as my right-hand person then as well when we had about 40 people on the telesales floor and about uh, 15, 20 people supporting uh, then as well. And at its peak, we were handling 30,000 calls per month. That's not per year, that's per month. So it was, uh, it was really interesting, but some of those learnings have been fantastic because although business growth bureaus are a very different type of organization, um, you know, the, the great thing is, is that I very much believe in the whole importance of this whole thing around community. And uh, this is, I personally get great pleasure out of building circular relationships where everyone wins. So whether it be your prospects, your clients, your partners, your associates, your suppliers, investors, and um, also, if you find a good way of uh, looking after your management team and staff as well, um, then that's really good. Uh, a lot of companies will talk about a so-called win-win, um, especially if it's a large company and a small one. Invariably, that means win-lose, i.e. large companies think they've got the clout, and the small company pretty well has to, I wouldn't say do as it's told, but um, it can be more of a subservient relationship. I actually feel it's really important that we all look out for each other and that way you end up with a very uh, a fantastic group of people where they um, you know, want to work together and also find ways of giving to each other and supporting each other. So I'm very lucky as well because I've got an advisory team. Um, Chris Cooper, as you referred to earlier on, is involved with the live streams. Um, he's taking a slightly different role from January moving onwards because uh, he's got very busy in what he's doing. So he's going to be involved about once a month um, and from now on. And of course, uh, we're going to set up another uh, panel um, of people who would like to take part in uh, the weekly live streams. Or that, that'll be, we'll be running those ex expert sessions once a month. And Karen Davies is a bit of a personal uh, mentor to me. Um, she's got a lot of experience working with organizations as Vistage and also people at some middle senior management level. Um, Alex Redden. Uh, Alex, if you're here today, just introduce yourself in the chat. So I'm not sure you are here today. Um, but Alex Redden, um, great guy, uh, a, a director of IBM, responsible for 5,000 people globally working for him uh, at one time. But we're very blessed to have these people on our advisory uh, team. And moving on from here, um, uh, what we want to do is obviously help you in the areas we've described. Uh, fundamentally, by leveraging technology, we can help you to give your time back. And we've got this great desire to make a difference. And I think that's a nice thing as well, that a lot of the people in our community actually really do care about others as well. Um, so, uh, and you know, that's the type of environment we're trying to create with all of this. Um, so we're here to, as part of this, as well as being a community membership-based organization, we want to help you to do the job once and create content to repurpose and amplify it many times. We want to provide you with a solution in the box to create a lead, uh, strong lead flow of opportunities month in, month out, and also show you how and give you access to the tools uh, to give you uh, the ability to leverage your entire uh, marketing uh, efforts. Now, we're going to be moving more on to the market insight session. 
um, in just a, a moment and how this will impact your business. Um, is there any questions that are cropping up so far or anything that's uh, come to uh, mind? No, no, nothing yet. Okay. All right. So uh, let's move on in that case then. So um, just some market insights. Now, those of you who are clients of us or have been on this before, you may be familiar with this. If you are not aware of this, then it's really worthwhile looking at these numbers. Uh, now, this is the distribution of limited companies in the UK. This excludes companies which are sole traders. So if you include sole traders in there, uh, by definition, they so the 3.2 million businesses, which are one-person businesses, that i.e. the one director companies with no employees, um, that number speaks for itself. There's, I think, another three or four million sole traders, if you add it to those figures. So that number is actually considerably uh, distorted, way beyond what's predicted here. But the point I'm trying to make is that 74% business in the UK um, it are just one-person businesses. That's just limited companies, okay? Um, now, the percentages will vary from one country to another. But, for example, if, you, if you're watching from the US here today um, or you're taking part in Asia or parts of the Middle East, and what you'll find is these percentages are very similar in most what we regard as very entrepreneurial economies, um, then as percentages, these are not usually too far out. So 74% of this is one person business in the UK. Um, about 1.2 million or 21% employ between two and 10 people. So that means that 95% of businesses are employ less than 10 people. And there's another 220,000 businesses which actually employ between um, uh, between 11 and 50. So this that's that's 99%. So 99% of businesses employ less than 50 people. You've got one percent of businesses which are um, employ more than 50, up to 250. And then there's, believe it or not, there's about six and a half thousand businesses, which sounds like a lot, um, which are the real corporates. Uh, now, to actually clarify that part of it is obviously the corporates themselves um, would tend to employ almost half the workforce. But the other side of it is the other 99 percent actually perhaps generate a, a lot of the wealth for the UK economy. So, um, you know, there tend to be some of the first sectors which tend to be hit by some form of recession. Uh, less resilient, but they're also some of the best, faster sectors to come back again as well. So the reason I particularly focus on this, it's really important to understand that your perception may be that your service or products appeal to more or less um, anyone, quote unquote. Um, and usually if someone says that, that means that they haven't properly looked at the market. And as a consequence, they are coming across as generalist and they're going to really perpetually struggle to actually uh, build in you know, a strong revenue stream. It really is about micro-segmented down. So it may well be out of that 3.2 million businesses, as a case in point, it may well be that uh, perhaps less than 10% or even a lot less could be in your target group, um, Okay, and even in the sector above. So the reason I'm drawing this to your attention is, is that it's really important to niche and micro-niche and micro-niche again. And we'll be hearing a little bit from that with... Um, from Paul later on, later on today, actually, and also with Raymond uh, too, um, because uh, Paul has got a really interesting product, which I'll keep a little bit of secrets a bit later on, as it were. Um, but uh, his service could appeal to uh, many people. The difficulty is he wants to reach the, the few, uh, which are going to give him the roots of the distribution. I don't want to spoil his thunder with this, but we'll touch on that a bit more um, a bit later on. So the targeting is absolutely paramount with all of this. Um, the other part is if you're largely selling time for money as a business coach, trainer, mentor, or consultant, then we've got the, what we class as rule of three thirds. So what we mean by that is that about a third of um, your time you're spent uh, prospecting and trying to find clients. The other third is spent on self-development and avoiding avoid periods where perhaps you're not uh, uh, not fully utilised in terms of your uh, services, and the other th third of the time is on fee-paying work. Okay, now wh why is this so important? Well, a lot of people who are selling time for money, as a case in point, will think, okay, well, what do I earn? Need to earn per year? So they are making these figures up. So they might turn around and say, well, I want to earn a hundred thousand pounds or dollars uh, per year. OK, and um, so you might then they might then say to themselves, well, OK, there's how many working days there are in a year? So 
that's 260 working days, less time for holidays, uh, sickness, looking after children, uh, and so on. So that to knock off another 40 days, so that's 220 days, okay? Um, now, a lot of people then say, okay, well, I'll take the 100,000 and then divide by 220, and that's the amount that I should be uh, effectively billing out as a daily rate, as a minimum. And the answer to that is a definite uh, wrong. Um, what you need to do is take that 220 and divide it by 70. The 70 being uh, because you take 220 divided by a third or by three, that gives you 70 days. So the 100,000 a year that you want to earn, you need to make sure you earn that over the 70 days. Um, now, obviously, it's not necessarily a good tactic to, to quote a chargeable daily rate. It's much better to package your services up in different ways. Um, but the point I'm just trying to make is that a lot of people we come across, um, especially in the microspace or where they are coaches, training, medical consultants, they will get this part wrong and they'll wonder why. They're always perpetually strug struggling to get the revenue in that they need. And they, they end up by not being able to put the option mask on themselves, which, of course, is not a, a good scenario to be in. Uh, then, of course, you've got uh, things like peaks and troughs. I'm sure we all relate to this. And uh, so this can be for seasonal factors, you know, like Christmas. Sometimes sales go up for certain businesses at Christmas time. Other times they go down. Holiday periods, um, it could be as well because um, you get a recession. Now, we were due for a recession around about now anyway, um, if, forgetting about COVID, because every 10 to 11 years, you'd end up cyclically having a recession where the last big one was probably 2009, 2010. We know what happened then. Um, uh, having said that, obviously the pandemic has uh, inflicted, inflicted untold damage, but there's also unfold op un untold opportunity as well, moving forwards with that. Um, and equally, the, you know, the, 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 one of the biggest things we see actually, which is not really any of those, is the fact that when people start to get oversubscribed, the natural tendency is to actually take their foot off the off the pedal, okay? And uh, the trouble is because they go into service delivery mode, okay? Uh, the problem with that is you end up with perpetual troughs. Uh, so you get your trough, you start to then think, I need to do my marketing again. You start to get some more business come in, then you get oversubscribed again, so you take your foot off the pedal. And so it, so it continues. And a lot of the things we're going to be discussing with today are particularly friendly to the way that businesses operate in the real world. So ideally, things which are very time consuming that you need to do is you need to find ways of being able to do that without the minimal, with the minimal amount of time, but get the maximum amount of results. So you can smooth out those peaks and troughs and also put yourself on a growth path. And the other thing is really about getting your target and marketing right. If, you know, what worked a year ago, uh, be part of last year may not work now and the other way around. So then we'll look at the social selling blueprint a little bit more. Now, just to give you a bit more of an infill on this, um, on the lead generation side, imagine you've got a bucket at the very top, okay? And what you do is you would go out and find your ideal type of leads. They would go into your bucket and they go into your whole lead generation system, okay? Um, so that would start to get the first cog uh, turning, okay? Uh, now, the crucial thing with that is to make sure you get your targeting segmentation right, which we'll come to a little bit more later on. But at least you can get that first cog uh, turning. And the good news is, is you don't necessarily need to do any pay-per-click for that um, either to get that really turning. The second cog really is about having that five-message process, which we'll come on to a bit later on. Um, in our particular case, we quite often have a six- or seven-message process uh, but it, it's very easy for us because we, we've got our own solutions, uh, which we provide for ourselves, but for our clients. So it's, you know, we used to have a team of 15 people in the Philippines um, working with us on this so we could actually pass those things back on to our clients. Um, because of technology now, we've now got to reduce that down to two. Um, and that's because instead of spending three to five hours a day per client running a campaign, we're able to use these uh, solutions in uh, the uh, toolbox, as it were. But the trick is to get people warmed up so they're actually asking to have confirmation, conversations. And that's where your sales optimization process is, um, is, is, really, uh, is really important. Um, now, at this point, I'd just like to pick up something that Tom's actually made, a really interesting point here. So let's bring Tom's up question here. Um, 
Yes, uh, Tom, as a point, he's raised this as a really good point. I would 100% uh, agree with that, uh, by the way, um, with a couple of slight caveats, okay? And I'll just share a little bit of a personal story with this. Um, there's a big argument for outsourcing where you can, uh, even better argu argument if you can use technology to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, and I'll just share a little bit of a personal story uh, because and this really relates to the sales optimization system, the third cog. But uh, going back about 12, 14 years ago when I ran this previous organization and we were handling over 30,000 calls a month, um, from our point of view, we tried to outsource some of the sales function to a couple of really good uh, call centers. And the call centers in question had really good reputation. We met the directors of the call centers and we also met a lot of the staff and the, the management. Um, and we actually tried outsourcing that part of it. And what we found is at the time, uh, admittedly it was a completely different type of product or service. It was the retail price was 165 pounds, so a very different type of product. Um, and what we'd find is that people, when they rang out in, between uh, 35 and 45% of people would actually convert on the spot to becoming a fee-paying client, okay? We had a very compelling offer and people loved it and they just bought it, okay? Um, but because we were getting totally overwhelmed with interest, what we tried to do, as I say, is outsource a lot of that. And that's where it started to uh, cause us big problems. And it wasn't because the call centre wasn't any good or the people weren't any good. But what we established was, in effect, that it didn't matter how good that people resource was, is because they were having to serve multiple clients, there wasn't the same emotional attachment to the product or service we were offering. So what we found is this, the opportunity we passed out to a third party from uh, a conversion rate of 35 to 45%, it actually dropped down to between 10 and 15%. So not only were we paying more in the way of costs, but our revenue base fell away. So we ended up, uh, we, and we actually split tested between two different facilities and we actually met the team several times. And there was nothing fun really wrong with them. It's just that, that their passion wasn't quite there. They didn't have the same empathy for the product or service. So one of the things I would say is that is on the, the, the sales closing part of it, uh, sales optimization side, I would generally say it's much better to do that part either yourself or with your own sales team, your own business development resource, okay? Um, ideally, don't outsource that part of it uh, because that's probably where there is some of the greatest risk. Where there is an opportunity to potentially outsource a bit is particularly around the first two cogs. But what we would say is actually even then, uh, and this is coming from us, bear in mind that we offered this service as a done with you service until middle part of last year. Um, even then, we like clients to be very much in control in terms of what they are are doing um, so that um, that they can be in control of the, the, the success of the campaigns as well. We'll come on to that a bit later on. So, um, yeah, so it, it's interesting. So to Tom Eccles, I'll just display this one as well, if that's all right, Tom. Uh, so it's interesting, you've got two Toms on this call. So we bought temporary sales team as we believe it can't sell everything if you don't blame me a second. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that I hundred percent agree with that, Tom. And thank you very much for sharing that. Uh what'd be nice to know, Tom, uh, is what industry sector you're from as well, actually. Um so but that's great feedback. So thank you for doing that. And um uh, Tom Brown saying, uh yeah. Uh, that's perfect. And uh, I'd again, Tom Brown, I'd agree with that. Um, the other thing where it can work very well, actually, is the outsourcing part, is if you look at the prospect nurturing process and the sales optimization uh, piece, um, it, what you can outsource quite often is to like a really good virtual PA, okay? Um, because the initial part of the call, you don't, People, when they speak to a virtual PA or a PA, they don't necessarily expect the PA to be able to answer every question for them. But what they know is that if they spoke to speak to the PA, that that person will deal with that call competently and professionally. And uh, what you can do, if you do things the right way, you can use that resource to help you qualify that lead or opportunity. So then you're only getting involved or your senior BDMs or whatever it may be, are only getting involved when that person's been a little bit more uh, qualified. Um, and uh, so Renata is joining us as well. So thank you. Uh, yeah, interesting, Renata. You'll have to share a little bit more on that one and uh, not uh, 
I'll be, I'm sure you'll have some more background on that. So it's good to happy new year, Renato. By the way, it's nice to see you on the call. Um, now this is talking a little bit more about from a business development manager's perspective, uh, or rather from company's perspective, looking at business development managers. On the left hand side, if you don't have a very well optimized uh, process, what you tend to find is your business development resource will be actually working. Um, on cold leads. So by the time you spend 40% of your time prospecting um, and uh, perhaps uh, 25%, so 65% of your time is then spent working on cold leads, a lot of people don't appreciate or direct visit leaders of companies don't appreciate that that has a massive negative impact on the business because most business firm managers will actually burn out very quickly. That, that type of resource may take six months to train up. They typically tend to be quite an expensive resource. And what happens is you get very high churn then because they don't stay with you. And that in itself is a very hit, big hidden cost because of recruitment costs and fresh training costs again. So what we would argue is it's much better that you follow the principles on the right. So what you then do is you um, uh, get uh, people, prospects warmed up to the point where we're actually asking to have those conversations. So the business development managers or the sales director, or if it's yourself, are spending the time on the hot prospects and therefore, not only are you going over your own sales targets, but the um, your business development managers are as well. They earn more commission out of the business, makes more money. Your cost base is actually lower. So guess what? Your profitability um, actually really goes up. So just, just worth bearing in mind. And then if we were to look at some other parts around this as well, this is to do with uh, LinkedIn uh, profiles. Uh, we done uh, we research over well over 2,000 LinkedIn profiles, and we estimate that only 25% of profiles are actually either properly optimized or semi-optimized. And um, the point I just make, it isn't necessarily your fault, by the way, um, because typically most people do LinkedIn the way that uh, their LinkedIn profile or create their LinkedIn profile uh, along the ways that uh, they believe that LinkedIn would want to see it. And in effect, what they do is they create their profile to look like a, a glorified CV. Now, if you're job hunting or in the job market, then do precisely that. But I assume that because you're on this call today, you're much more interested in it from a uh, business point of view in terms of finding new clients. And it's a completely different approach. OK, so I will be getting a little bit more into a bit more detail about the um, profile optimization side a bit later on. And just to bring things into context as well, now we've got an email list of uh, 62,000 businesses we, um, uh, which we've continued to engage. We're actually in the process of narrowing that down a little bit now um, just to make sure that we're engaged with people who want to be engaged with and so on. But it's still a very big list. And we uh, get about 9% of business through referrals. The reason that's uh, on the, what appears to be on the lower side is because all the other parts really dwarf it because I've created a whole system behind everything we do so that we've got a continual flow of new opportunities coming in. Um, uh, we also do a little bit of Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we do retargeting. We don't spend much money on the advertising on those platforms. And it's not, if, if, if for our particular sector, it's not so effective. For others, it could be very effective using Facebook or Instagram. But what we do there is we use Facebook and Instagram very selectively for what we class as retargeting. Now, that's a very big topic in its own right. Um, OK, uh, but you, that's a relatively small amount. OK, 61 percent of what we do, uh, despite our very large email list and despite referrals, actually comes from LinkedIn. So some of our best partnerships have also been formed uh, through LinkedIn as well. So um, it's not just great for finding potential clients, but it can be a really good way of finding potential wholesalers, partners, resellers uh, and so on. So uh, just worth bearing that in mind. Uh, now, there is a, always a little bit of an elephant in the room, uh, as you'd expect. Now, we've got one massive elephant at the moment, uh, which we're all we, we're probably all sick to death of hearing about. So I'm not proposing to go to much detail about that this afternoon. Um, but it is very much an opportunity for us to, to look outwards, uh, look at what we can, we're doing at the moment and how we can adapt and change. Then uh, our reptilian brain, because, of course, our brain goes back, you know, well, hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of years, depending who you uh, listen to, uh, obviously uh, it is very much built around the reptilian mindset. So when things go on in the wider economy like they are at the moment, the natural instinct is to 
um, to go to one of perceived uh, safety. Uh, you'll notice the use of the word perceived safety. And what happens then is people go into their cave, uh, they start to perhaps go into development mode, or they might do all sorts of things, anything but sales. I think it's the uh, saying that someone else uses, I know, which is very true, when actually what you should be doing is looking outwards, speaking to your existing customers, looking at them, also engaging with prospects, prospects and advocates, um, but with the caveat that um, cash flow is king, okay? And um, also it's important as well to understand the difference between spending good money versus bad money. Now, a lot of people, if especially in the micro-business sector, a lot of people think, well, actually their natural instinct would be to actually, um, uh, you know, not spend any money whatsoever. The trouble is that tends to put you in a position, a bad position when the market starts to return. Okay, so even in uh, bad market conditions, you should ideally be investing in your business. And what I'm talking about there, it could be if you're into manufacturing or, or you know, it's a more of a bricks and mortar business, um, you know, making sure you've got the right type of equipment so you can so leverage and grow, uh, make sure distribution channels are right, but also make sure you've got a very good sales process so that despite the state of the market that you've got ways of bringing new clients in, and um, typically as well, the big thing with that is as the market starts to return, then, of course, it puts you in a really good position. Now, that's good money and um, versus bad money, which is spending things which are actually not going to add to the success and wealth of your business. Um, now, obviously, Robert Kosaki talks about this a lot. Um, as uh, Mural mentioned about uh, uh, Daniel a bit later, later on, um, uh, he, Robert Kosaki talks about uh, you know about this in a very, very good 15 minute video on uh, YouTube or TED. Um, just look that out. But he talks about good money, bad money, not quite in this context, but nevertheless, you may find that quite interesting. So uh, it is very much a case of investing in your business and the market returns. Um, so what? Uh, uh, just to go back again, I would suggest that really, you know, it is about helping to grow you and your business. And it's about having the right social selling system in place. Um, if you want to scale your business, not everyone wants to scale the business. Sometimes people will just want uh, more organic growth or faster growth. Uh, there are others who want to scale their businesses. Um, the strategy you adopt from a marketing point of view may be quite different, um, uh, but uh, we can obviously discuss that with you if that's relevant. And of course, it's everything has to center around your customer and your products and markets. Uh, and every part around that. Now, I think before we move on, this could be a really good point, actually. Um, Miro, could you share the link with Paul? Uh, Paul, if you could very kindly uh, join us in the green room, okay? Uh, what we'll do is we'll see your details come through in just a moment, and I'll bring you up on air. So we'll probably have a break at about 3.15, so in about 20, 25 minutes' time. Um, and what we'll just, we'll come on for a few minutes, just give Paul a chance to come in and uh, Let's try and bring you on air. And, and Paul, when you come on air, just make sure you, you mute your Facebook or YouTube uh, a, a video stream. Otherwise, we'll get very bad echo. So I look forward to seeing you in just a moment. So, Paul, just make sure we're all uh, um, uh, uh, giving you the link and we'll go from there. Yeah, okay. I emailed it to him earlier, so he's got the link. OK, lovely. All right. Thank you. So what we're going to talk about now is about the importance of building uh, tribes and supporters uh, to help you to achieve uh, growth and be part of an active community. And uh, why is a good having a, being a good tribe leader so important? Okay, so I think it's got some, you know, examples of this of people who've just been on our live streams recently. So, uh, well, uh, Neil Lawson, this is him with uh, Chris Cooper on our Thursday live streams a few months ago. And one of the things that Neil Lawson is known for is ex-Special Forces, but he's also been up Everest six times. Uh, the top left-hand picture there is a picture of him with uh, Bear Grylls. Um, and uh, he's also famous for hosting a dinner, part, dinner party at 22,000 feet and also got caught up in the Nepal um, earthquake as well. Um, so and the, the other picture there is him flying a, flying a microlight uh, from here to Timbuktu. Now, we're not asking you to suggest or suggesting you do anything as mad as that. And um, Neil's an amazing guy uh, as well. Very, very inspirational. Um, but, uh, you know, us as ordinary people can do amazing things. So let's look at a few other examples uh, of those people who have done amazing things. Obviously, we know what Marcus Rashford has done uh, already. Um, and, of course, uh, Sir Tom. Um, but look at the size of Sir Tom, 1.5 million people. 
Uh, Patrick Hutchinson, you know, before the, this whole thing around Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, didn't really have any form of presence. But this iconic picture where he helped to save um, someone uh, from what was sort of really going on, um, you know, what really struck me, a chord, struck a chord with me then is what he described. Remember the interview at the time, he described the reason that he did this is that we're, we're, we, his, lo his love for fellow man, and also he described it as we're all one people, all one race. So these are examples of just ordinary people uh, doing amazing things. So don't feel just as one person, you can't have a massive impact. We can all have an impact, okay? And the way you can leverage this whole thing around uh, a, a tribe um, is, is basically by, uh, once you start to, you can, the way of building up your tribe is by using things like social media, content creation, video conferences, webinars, video and podcast, uh, podcast creation, email, uh, online marketing, and so on. The trouble is a lot of this in itself can be very time-consuming. A lot of people make the mistake of perhaps just becoming almost, creating this as almost one continual process or machine. But the impact can be, if you, if you do th don't do things the right way, can be minimal, whereas if you do it the other way, you can really leverage uh, what you're actually doing. But it's much easier if you can position yourselves as uh, being a tribe leader, as it were. Um, and the other thing uh, which really struck a chord is, and I know several other people have found this really helpful when I've shared this, is, um, is remember if something is free, then that you are the asset and the commodity. So for example, let's look at um, uh, Facebook as a case in point. Uh, do Facebook charge you for accessing their platform? No, these fantastic platforms, which Facebook or Instagram and the others, um, are here, no cost to us, and yet we have the, uh, the benefit of their platforms. The other side, the, the trade-off, is that, of course, um, for all that data and the very careful retargeting that you can do through things like Facebook, you, you, us as individuals are the asset and the commodity. Okay, and that's really important to understand. And the other thing around that, it's really important that you understand as well that you either invest your time or you invest money or both. Um, if you invest your money, then, of course, you don't have to spend so much time trying to find customers, but you, obviously you're having to pay out of your hard-earned cash, which is coming straight off your bottom line. Uh, on the other hand, you are getting back some of your time. And the big thing as well is a lot of people try and do a lot of these things themselves, and they... I don't mean it in a bad way this, but they become in effect busy fools. You know, we, we end up by just doing a lot of things because it, it perhaps it helps us to justify uh, what we're doing or our existence. When in reality, we, what we need to be doing is finding a really good way of engaging with people and then doing it, be able to do it in such a way um, uh, that, uh, uh, that you can get your time back, if that makes sense. Um, so Mural, is Paul having trouble getting on? Right. Um, so if Paul's having difficulty, by the way, Paul, just make sure on your tab that you mute the uh, speaker in your video stream for either Facebook Live or, or YouTube. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Paul was with us a minute ago, but he was having trouble muting himself on oh, Facebook. He's coming here. He's back with us now. Perfect. Lovely. OK, so Paul, we'll be with you in just a second. Thank you very much. We can see you in the green room now, so we don't need to. We can, we can all chill out and relax know that, knowing you're there. So remember, uh, it really is about leveraging your marketing and sales effort and doing things in such a way that you, you can get your time uh, back. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover another point, a few points in a moment. I think it's been a really nice time to uh, bring Paul in, uh, if that's all right. So here we go. So, Paul, welcome. Hello, Paul. Can you hear us okay? I think he's just unmusing himself as we speak. No pressure, Paul. <laughs> so, Paul, I take it you can hear us, can you? I'm not sure he can. No, I don't think he can. <laughs> no, okay. Miro, if you could, if necessary, just try and call Mo Paul on his mobile and try and help him if that's all right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so we'll come back to Paul. Paul, can you hear us now? Well, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, we can. Ruby, can you put your hand up if you can? We can. <laughs> we can hear you. Can you hear us? No. Um, Miro, I'll let you speak to Paul, and we'll come back to Paul in just a moment. Cheers. 
Right. Okay. So what we'll do, we'll carry on for a few moments. We'll try and bring Paul in again in uh, just a moment. Uh, things you always try and plan things in uh, Blue, Blue Peter fashion, but it's never always meant to be. But there we go. Uh, so uh, let's uh, we go. So let's come back to this here. So it's really about uh, being able to leverage your time. And uh, um, what we'll do now is we're going to focus a little bit more on what we class as the amplify your brand part of this. OK, now um, I would recommend if you can write these down, it's going to be quite difficult for you because I'm going to go quite fast on this. But what I would say as a point of reassurance is when we invite you to complete the sales and diagnostic uh, questionnaire a bit later on, the questions are based around this. OK, so what I'm going to share with you now, um, actually, just give me a second because I lost my notes on this one a second. Let's grab it from the uh, printer. Um, is look at it, First of all, look at how you can... Uh, to sort of really elevate your brand so people recognize you as being an expert in your uh, particular space. Um, it's all about accelerating the level of trust that people are attracted in uh, dealing with you. And what can you do or put in place where you can do the job once and repurpose the content, uh, saving, uh, saving your time? Um, how can you attract um, uh, much bigger audiences on multiple channels? And it's also about finding solutions uh, to help you solve complex problems which are too demanding of your time. So if things things are taking you a lot of time, invariably there are things you can put in place to actually place to give you that time back. Look at how, how about some webinars? What are you putting in place around webinars, especially automated webinars, where it can do the pre-selling for you? Um, and have you thought about writing a book? Now, writing a book fears the uh, puts a dread thought dread of thought into me certainly because it can be. Uh, you know, it's a case of where you start, but there actually are some really good tactics for that. And uh, we can show you how to go, go about it. And how can you create content and reports from everything you're doing? And um, uh, how about running online events? A bit like we're running now. Um, you can obviously leverage the relationships. So obviously, it's a one-to-many type of conversation as part of today. Um, look at what poss may be possible in terms of attracting sponsors. Um, looking at the tools, which may make you a lot more uh, efficient um, and what can you do to put in place to leverage the power of uh, LinkedIn but with you being in full control of uh, the results and uh, how you, can you develop the hot prospects so they're asking for more information and have sales-based conversations and um, what you can put in place in terms of using technology uh, to run your LinkedIn campaign so it does all the heavy lifting for you but with you being in full control and um, have you looked at things like hyper-personalization? It's now uh, quite feasible to do a combination of uh, messages together with images and text combined. Uh, it's one of these things you actually almost need to see it to believe it can be really, really powerful now. And I'm pleased to say we can offer that through a number of different uh, platforms for you. And how you can be part of a supportive community. Have you got people around you who are really interested in helping you and supporting your growth? and um, how you can build your email lists um, around email campaigns in a GDPR-friendly way. Now, um, just to touch on the GDPR part of it a little bit. Now, obviously, I'm not a lawyer. Um, there are people here which may know on, on this call a lot more than I do in this space, but the rules about engaging with uh, businesses are much more relaxed than they are if you're uh, um, engaging with individual consumers where uh, you're communicating through private email addresses. So uh, I won't go into more detail on this at the moment, but where that does have a significant is you, uh, effect is that you can do much more of a joined up campaign if you wish to do so, where you're using these other uh, mediums. So um, basically, if you feel a bit overwhelmed with that, don't worry, uh, we do have you covered. Um, we'll, we're very much here to help you on that uh, part of the uh, journey. So we want to help to, you to bring yourself forward, amplify your brand so you get your time back. Um, and what we'll do is we'll move on to that part in a moment. So let's see if we can try and bring Paul back in again. Uh, into yeah, the green. he should be fine now. Um, okay, right, good, excellent. So, Paul, you, you can you hear us this time round? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can indeed. We can hear you perfectly. Fantastic. Good, excellent. Right. Let's uh, see if we can bring us both in together. Uh, now, Paul, you've got two very interesting parts to your um business so i'd just like to just share a little bit of information on paul um i've only been blessed uh, sorry <laughs> i was trying to pay your compliments realized it came, came out the wrong way yeah. uh, 
to be very blessed in knowing you, but only for a short while in in a positive way, not a negative way. Um, uh, but you've got two main business interests, but you've got a really interesting product, which actually, obviously we're not here to promote any form products today, but obviously you've got a product around COVID, which is really interesting. Do you want to just share that a little bit to, with us as well here? And also, you and I had a bit of a discussion about what was a very big market, how you could actually reach those niches and micro niches we'll come to in just a moment. Can you just share us a little bit of insight in terms of what you do around your product as from end? Okay, I'll just give you a, a little bit of background about my um, other business as well, if I, if I may. So um, I'm co-founder of a, a company called Advent Insurance Management, and we provide uh, claim services to the insurance industry. It's quite common for insurers to outsource their claims, handler, uh, claims handling, so we, we do that. Um, but also we provide um, technology solutions. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we provide technology solutions. So um, as an example, we've um, implemented a, a global payment system for where um, the insurance industry is using experts such as loss adjusters, surveyors, um, forensic accountants, um, solicitors, etc. And it's ability for them to get paid quickly and efficiently and have good MI in place. Um, and this sort of technology issues is something that the, the London insurance market really suffers with. So, um, so that's a, a great space for us. And we've only been trading trading five years, and not quite as successful as, as you, but we're up to a revenue of about two million per annum. So, so we're doing sort of fairly well. Um, the COVID-related thing that you've asked me to talk about um, relates to rapid testing. Um, so, people may have seen on TV that um, rapid testing is now available in schools and universities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, there's been some concerns about these, these test kits. Well, it's now possible to provide test kits, um, rapid test kits um, to the masses, um, a, a really cheap cost, um, something that's far, far cheaper than if you went online and looked at Boots or Lloyd's Pharmacy or something like that. And they can deliver results within sort of two minutes sometimes, um, up to 15 minutes. So you can buy a test kit, you can test yourself at home, and you know whether you're positive or negative within two to 15 minutes. And these, got, these have been signed off by all the sort of necessary regulatory bodies, and um, they've got an accuracy ratio of 97%. Wow. Um, so, so, of course, what this does is it gives people the ability to, you know, open up their bubbles, um, you know, test people before they come into their households. It allows people that are part of their job is actually going out in, into the community and for them to sort of test and test people that they're going into the household. So it's... It's got real wide-reaching benefits, and as I say, it, it's a fraction of the price of what's um, what's actually out there at the moment. Yeah. No. Um, thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Um, now, the reason I've asked Paul particularly to share this story, um, especially around the test kits, not not only because you may know of people who would greatly benefit from this, and equally organisations which could benefit as well. But actually, there's a much uh, another part to this as well. It's one of the things that we sort of discussed about a little bit before Christmas was uh, actually, the, on one hand, the market is so vast, um, is, you know, where, where on earth do you start? And we talked a lot about, was it segmentation, didn't we? It's a very uh, horrible word, but about segmentation, how you could segment and micro-segment and micro-segment again so you could get to those, those individuals that would help to give you uh, the leverage, didn't we? And... Um, what, what does a really good, just give us a bit of a feel what a really good client looks like to you because I'd like to relate this a little bit more in terms of strategy you can put in place to niche down so other people can benefit from understanding they can really niche down to get to your ideal target client groups. Yeah, so it's, it's a mixture really. So within the insurance industry, I've already got links into loss adjusters and surveyors, so I, I've already reached out to them and, and they've taken me up on the the offer of um using some of these kits but the ideal client has to be somebody that's that's looking at mass distribution so you know getting this into schools getting it into universities um possibly getting it into football stadiums or or um, events so that people can actually be tested before they go into the events so you know a client, great client might be something like boots it might be like lloyd's pharmacy or it could be tesco's it could be sainsbury's um and so what you've done is you've given me some really clear advice on how to target those sectors. Um, so prior to us connecting, which was literally only two weeks ago, um, I, I've got 8,500 contacts on LinkedIn, which I thought was great. Um, but I don't use those contacts, and I didn't know how to use those contacts. And through the use of your tools, um, it's given me the ability to make far more new contacts in a, a targeted way. 
and target certain industry sectors. Yeah, no, lovely. Well, thank you, thank you, thanks for that. Uh, that's really appreciated. Um, I think the uh, part of Paul, if it's right, if I could share with everyone happy for me to do this, is um, one of the things we really talked about was that you've already given some really good indications there of um, perhaps schools uh, could be universities, it could be sports grounds, and so on. But we and we also talked about who might be in the marketplace who would give you those routes of distribution as well, didn't we? So. Um, which would which would enable those multiple sales? Because if if you're trying to sell uh, offer individual test kits, you know, as one kit, you, there's no return for you, is there? Because it it costs you far more to to administer that and send it out um, than anything else. Um, so, because I think the context we would talk about as well is in terms of through LinkedIn, how you've been able to really segment those down. Um, so how we, when you first started off, you know you do a countdown on LinkedIn and you do a bit of a filter. Presumably, when you first start, you end up with a very large number, which just almost went off the Richter scale. What, what, how many were there to start with when you started reaching out? How many did you manage to narrow that down to in the end of people who were primarily looking to speak to? Um, so I think there was about 27 million. Um, so through the tools in LinkedIn, you could reach out to 27 million. But... It just becomes crazy. And as you say, they're, they're individuals, they're small businesses, they're big businesses, they're influencers, they're non-influencers. So it was really trying to target those down. And so as one sector we looked at was the, the sort of health sector, mm. um, sort of sports clubs, fitness and that sort of thing. And through looking at sort of C-level directors, managers, um, people that could actually influence the purchase opportunity, we managed to get it down to sort of 250 people. Wow. So within each sector, sort of really target those people that could influence it. Yeah, no, that's lovely. Right, that, that, that's a really um, good, good example, actually. Now, the reason why I, I go into this part of it particularly is, um, which uh, Paul, you and I have discussed already, and hence you've uh, been very sensible and decided to go down that route, is a lot of people, when they first do their searches on LinkedIn, this is benefit for everyone here, is they'll end up with some very big numbers. And it, of course, LinkedIn are only ever going to give you a tiny segment of that, even if you go for their sales navigator product. But what you've been able to do is you've also been able to, be able to pre-approve all those people before they go into a campaign, haven't you? So you know you're only a able to reach, you're only going to be reaching out to those people you've pre-approved. So um, what Paul's done very smartly here is to be able to determine what his overall list is segment it, segment it down again, segment it down again. He's got his core 250 people, and that, that's part of the first campaign is to reach out to those who have understood it correctly um, with that. And the nice thing is, of course, you then target another micro-niche, can't you, after that, then another micro-niche, and then another micro-niche. And of course, the best thing is, apart from paying for any, don't need to pay for any pay for click for this, apart from a sales navigator account, you, 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 LinkedIn give you the tools of the toolbox uh, to better at least find those people. It's then about how you engage with them and then do everything else around it, isn't it? So, um, is that yeah. a fair Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair summary. So it, it's, it's proven really useful and um, yeah, I'm really excited what um, the next few weeks holds for me. No, lovely. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Also, we're looking forward to uh, uh, to working with you. Have we had any questions come up? That people yeah, might we have, Rupert. Um, this is for Paul. So Thomas Eccles has asked, that's very interesting, what is the production rate of these kits, Paul? Uh, there's currently 2 million kits coming in per week. Well, wow. that's quite a few. So I think you could yeah. satisfy the supply there, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So currently we have stock of um, kits, of um, boxes of 20 kits. Um, so they're not sold individually. And we're hoping to have boxes of five kits within the next few days. Wow, um, that's that's really two million kits coming in per week. Yeah, yeah no, good. Um, now, obviously, if any of you are very interested in this, by the way, obviously, because it's not really about promotion today, because it's about sharing value. But if you would be very happy to message Mural or myself um, uh, privately on this, what we'll do is we'll pass any uh, interest straight on to Paul uh, for you um, on that. Uh, but obviously, for example, you may yourself support a big football team. Uh, you know, or a conference centre, and you might know someone you, uh, there. So, um, uh, actually, Paul, why don't we give? Are you happy to give out your email address? Do you want to put that in the chat? We wouldn't normally do this, but do you want to put your email address in the chat and uh, on in, in the stream in a minute on Facebook? Or Miral, do you want yeah. to? Should we put it? Would you like us to put that in the chat for you? 
Paul? Yeah, happy for, for you to share yeah. that. Maybe yeah. I'll put in uh, Paul's um, email address okay. into the chat, if that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. That'll be yeah. the Panda, Panda Play for email address. Yeah. Yeah, of course, we'll do that. Um, and what, what we'll do is if, um, if you've got some people who you feel may uh, benefit from this, especially in light of what's sort of going on, if you could just message Paul uh, directly, uh, that'd be absolutely great. Um, I know Paul obviously is not so well equipped to deal with very small individual orders, but if you know organisations which may uh, uh, be able to give extended reach in that way, I know Paul would be very grateful for any introduction. So um, is there anything else, Paul, you'd like to add to this now? Not really. I think, um, I mean, if this had come sort of a month earlier, you know, how, how different could Christmas have looked? You know, we wouldn't have had to cancel our Christmas bubbles. We could have tested everyone that came into our house, um, which we actually did personally because we've got the kits. But, um, you know, it, it could have opened up Christmas for the masses. Yeah, it, it is a shame. And uh, it's, it's sad we only got to know you a few weeks ago, Paul. But uh, anyway, absolutely better, greatly delighted to have you on board here yeah, today. Thank Thanks yeah. for the opportunity. Thank no, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. Um, right. On this particular point, I think what we'll do is have a natural 15-minute uh, break. So what we'll do is uh, we'll be starting down 15 minutes. It's 3.13 3 at the moment. If you could look at all your clocks, it, what we'll do is we'll, we'll recommence again at 3.25. Okay. So um, we'll just come off street. We'll put mirror and I between us. We'll cover the chat in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but if you could all rejoin at 3.25, because we'll get started promptly. And we go on to the next session. Uh, and Paul, a very big thank you as well for your contribution here. Uh, I mm -hmm. think people got insight from that. So thank you very much indeed. So we'll stay, yeah. keep your Facebook or YouTube tab open with the stream switched on, but we'll just mute our cameras and mics just for uh, 12, 10, 12 minutes, give you all a break. Okay. See you in just a few moments. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.
Hello, good afternoon, everyone, again. It's 3.25, but I, technically I think I'm a few seconds late, so uh, hopefully uh, everyone's uh, forgiven me for that. Uh, Muriel, we're just uh, waiting for you to join us on the live stream, but uh, uh, we can no doubt get started. If you could just very kindly uh, just uh, say hello back in the chat again so we know you're there and uh, you're keen to get started and make sure uh, we keep this uh, conversation going online uh, you know, as quick as possible this afternoon, making sure we're sharing uh, lots of of value. So uh, welcome everyone again and also thanks to Paul for uh, sharing his insights. Uh, so the reason I wanted to drill down on that is uh, is about understanding how you, even if you've got a product or service which has very, very broad appeal, how you can really segment and micro, uh, micro uh, segment again to really reach your ideal uh, type of target clients. Um, so uh, what we'll do now is we'll get uh, we'll carry on because we've said 325 and it's now 326 and um, uh, we'll uh, so let's move on to the next part of it. So one of the things that we would uh, draw your attention to is the fact that it's really important about having a, what we class as a balanced product uh, portfolio and also it's important to get your marketing mix right um, and to make sure your social selling uh, blueprint is all in place. Uh, now, just a few quick hellos. So do introduce yourselves in the chat again, just so we know you're active there and you're you're engaged. Uh, welcome, Mark, by the way. Um, I've seen a lot of your emails coming through and also see you're going from strength to strength. Uh, David, welcome again. Thomas, welcome again. And uh, uh, Raymond, so Raymond, be ready because we'll have you in the green room probably the next 30, 40 minutes or, or so. Um, so what we'll do then is we will get started. I forgot to actually there's a 20 to 40 second delay. So I found myself uh, when it goes out through the social channels on YouTube and uh, Facebook, we may have started here, but you actually don't hear it on your side for about 20 to 40 seconds. Um, so, uh, uh, and even Muriel's come back now as well. So welcome Muriel. <laughs> I thought it was 3.30, sorry. <laughs> uh, 3.25, 3.25, but no worries, no worries. Um, okay, so lovely. So well, let's uh, carry on now uh, without uh, further delay. Um, so just in terms of your product mix, um, it is really important to make sure that you get your product positioning, uh, sorry, product pricing right to start with, um, and uh, also your research. Now, research doesn't always have to take the form of formal market research as such. Um, it can be a case of doing some real-time R&D with your potential customers, because at the end of the day, if your potential customers spend money with you, then you know you're potentially on to a good, um, good innings. What you don't necessarily know is whether you got your product pricing right, and there's all sorts of strategies you can put a, in place around that. But on the subject of product price, why we just talk about it, if, for example, you would buy a premium brand of car, for example, let's say an Aston Martin, and suddenly Aston Martin decided to get more sales, they would uh, reduce the price of their cars by you know, 50%. Um, what, what you'd find is invariably that would do a lot of harm to the brand. Okay, So they may get a bit of a surge in sales initially, but suddenly that car would not have the same perceived value in that person's mind. And as a consequence, the long-term effect of that could be very negative. So if you offer your service at too low a cost, that can do you just as much harm as if you get offer something at uh, too high a cost. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. It's also about getting your product proposition correct. And uh, we talk about a bit more about that in a moment. Also making sure your product is desirable and people actually do want what you have to sell. And you, you get your um, product mix right and your positioning right. So uh, moving on a little bit from that, here is an example of a, uh, a luxury coffee shop or tea rooms uh, which got oversubscribed. And I first, this actually was taken, photograph was taken in February, uh, literally uh, just down the street, you know, 20, 30, 50 yards away, there was another three or four coffee shops and they all were virtually empty. And yet this one, was probably one of the most expensive ones around there. And look, are people queuing up to get inside? So an example of an oversubscribed business. So what can you put in, strategies can you put in place to make sure your business is oversubscribed um, so that you don't have a shortage of customers and you can charge much more appropriately uh, for your product, service, or widget? Now, I'm just going to relate this a little bit to ourselves as well. We've It's about having a balanced product portfolio. 
So in our particular case, cl clearly we're more of a service-based business, although we do cut across onto the technology side as well. Um, so when we've got products for free, so for example, you're taking part in a mini conference this afternoon. Um, it's all about sharing value and accelerating the relationship of trust. And uh, uh, we also run the live streams for free and our networking collaboration events, they're for free. Um, so and the reason we do this is if we can build up deep, meaningful relationships at the very start, then you build up a very loyal following of people who want to see you succeed. And we can help a lot more people as well. So now that's all very well. Obviously, every business still has to make a profit. Um, otherwise, there's no point um, being in business because you won't last very long. And then what you may have is what you class as your foundation products. So, um, so a foundation product is something which would be a bit of a sprat to catch a mackerel. Now, a foundation product could be anything from an e-book or a book that you sell for five or 10 pounds or dollars, all the way up to something that's several thousand pounds, okay? So for example, if your core proposition has an average value of sale of 500 pounds, okay, your foundation product might be the example of a book, okay? It might be a 10 pound product, five pound product. If you've got a, a your core product is actually like a 5,000 pound, 10,000 pound, 50,000 pound, 100,000 pound sale, it may be your foundation product actually is around about the thousand pound mark, or it could be two thousand, five thousand pounds as a foundation product. Um, so you'll notice that the price points are very, very different, and that typically is because you're also appealing to completely different uh, customer uh, type as well. Okay, so let's take another, so a couple of real examples of this. If you're a coach, trainer, mentor, or consultant. You, your core proposition might be like a five or ten thousand pound sale. So in that case, the way of drawing people in is to offer something which is probably sub a thousand pounds or you know under about a thousand dollars. In which case, they make a, some form of purchase with you. Um, they've invested a bit of time and money, and it's not a big step to go up to the next level to go to one of your core products. Um, another example is an organisation that we've done quite a bit of work with who've got um, their, their complete opposite end, their average value of sale is, uh, as a core product, is between two and five million pounds. And their foundation products, interestingly enough, are typically a 50,000 pound or 100,000 uh, pound project. And the reason for that is in order for that big client to spend the three, five million pounds, they typically will have invested in a piece of work beforehand uh, to determine the need and the uh, to make it a safe proposition to go for. And that's then le led to the sale of core products. So your numbers are going to be very different to the type of people you're reaching to and uh, what you're offering to sell and how you position yourself in the marketplace. You also may then have products for upsells, cross-sells and um, everything else. So um, we've obviously, broadly speaking, replicated that model and it certainly works well for us. I would encourage you also to adopt something very similar yourselves if you're not already doing it. It's also about having an understanding of your ideal uh, client types, uh, your competition, um, how you stand out, what is your differentiation, and also your company positioning and your awareness. You need to make sure all those things uh, are absolutely in place. And uh, also you need to have a good marketing plan. Now, it doesn't need to be a formal living, breathing document, but certainly you should be able to adopt and use what we class the social selling blueprint. And as we've talked a bit earlier on, it's about having a really good um, uh, process involved around these, these three cogs fundamentally. So that way you can get them all turning in sync. And uh, a few quick case studies for you. Um, now, Claire Barrows runs a call center in the South Brown or Tunbridge Wells area. Um, in the first six months of working with her, we managed to help her find 11 new clients, which is uh, really exciting. Um, Claire has some very interesting clients, including people like Mercedes-Benz and others. Um, it's also important to understand that any marketing campaign you put in place um, needs to, that you understand the importance of the snowball effect. So when you first started reaching out, um, for example, it may be that people aren't ready to buy at that point. Just because it's convenient to you to sell what you have to set offer now, and you may want money in the bank now, in real terms, people have all got their own agendas and timelines that they work to. And a really interesting case in point, actually, I don't know if Damien's on the call today, but I've known Damien, for example, came on board as a client uh, for 
about five years. Um, and it's only recently he's become a client. And in his particular case, it wasn't because he didn't want what we had to sell or to offer. It was because the timing wasn't right. So what I would say to you is that with any form of marketing, whether you do it as pay-per-click or whether you uh, everything else, invest for the medium long term and focus with the customer in mind. And eventually, if you look after people well enough over a period of time, they will become much valued clients. Now, Michael Romney is another really interesting example, actually. In fact, I'm due to speak with him again tomorrow um, uh, as well. But Michael Romling, about five years ago, sold his uh, franchise business. He had about 60 franchisees. Um, he sold his business. And that meant, obviously, uh, as part of it, he was only able to keep two or three customers because uh, the rest were through other relationships associated to the franchise. And after about six, seven months, he realized actually a lot of these clients were drying up and he needed to do something about it. So he, he reached out to ourselves. Now, at the time, we were offering more of a done with you service. We got a team, uh, we, at the time, as peak, we had 18 people in the Philippines uh, working with us and we'd run done with you campaigns. And the good thing is, is now with the help of technology, we can offer this at a fraction of the cost, but we can put you in control so you can do this yourself. But he originally invested his 20K with us for a 12 month campaign. And he got a return investment of 160,000 pounds. So a very happy uh, a man. Uh, now, interestingly enough, um, he's also very smart because he realized that he didn't want to be a busy fool. Um, and he invested in a virtual PA who works from about two hours a day. And what she does is she basically manages all the inquiries that come through from the respective campaigns. And he only gets to speak to the people who are actually seriously interested in potentially working with him. He also tends to recharge um, much higher rates than the average person out there. Uh, in fact, one of his clients, interesting enough, I'm not sure he's still a current client, but uh, it was Putin, uh, President Putin. And um, he does a bit of his coaching around uh, golf. And it's not because he's an expert in golf. He isn't. It's more he uses golf as the vehicle to be able to work with people at a senior level uh, to help them engage and um, to extend their reach. But uh, very interesting guy, uh, Michael Romming. Now, to this day, uh, unless something's happened in the last few weeks, from which I'm unaware, Michael doesn't have a website to this day because what we've been able to do is to work with him so he's made sure his LinkedIn profile is very well optimised. He's running a very strong um, in, uh, campaign to reach out to people in his target market. And that's, of course, creating the lead flow of opportunities moving in and out. Now, uh, sorry, uh, moving throughout. Um, and he's about to re-engage with us based around what we class our business growth time machine as a solution in the box, which I'll come to a bit later on. And this here is an example of um, Adam Molson Form 3. This is, he's the gentleman on the left. Um, Alex is the person on the right. And there's an interview on our website. And this is... Um, the organization was telling you about where the, the average value of sales, a core proposition is like two to five million pounds. And it's because they're dealing with banks. They've got a piece of middleware or software which sits in between. Um, and uh, the, it typically requires a sign off within that, those organizations of between three and five people because the, it's a technology based uh, platform. And obviously, if something went wrong, um, the cost to the business would be extremely high. Uh, you know, to the bank concerns and also the reputational risk if something went wrong. Um, it's a very long sign-off period, but we've had a lot of fun working with Adam uh, Molson and um, he's got a very well-run business. I think we're up well over 100 people now they actually employ. And um, so a bit of a, a quick uh, uh, recap of in terms of what next, um, we will be talking a bit more about Google, Facebook and Instagram pay-per-click, what you can do with that. Uh, what we'll also cover a lot more around LinkedIn and also discuss some advanced techniques. And what we'll be also talking about is how to reach your ideal clients, a bit like we discussed with Paul a moment ago, and um, how you can avoid, avoid those expensive costs. So everything we're talking about here doesn't require any form of pay-per-click advertising whatsoever. Now, uh, the only thing we'd recommend um, is a, a sales LinkedIn sales navigator account because that gives you extended uh, reach. Um, and the big thing is it put you're in full control of the process. Now, just to slightly set the scene around this as well, a lot of people don't know this. But for example, let's say you were to do a pay-per-click pay campaign on Google or Facebook uh, and so on. Um, 
you know, 10 years ago, you'd be able to get away with having a, pay, a website with a one page landing page and you'd run uh, pay, pay per click campaigns on that against that landing page. And uh, if people are leading you to believe that you can get away with that now, that I'm afraid is completely incorrect. And the reason for it is that, yes, you will get some clicks. Uh, you may get some opt-ins from it, but Google won't give you a decent ranking um, with themselves unless the landing pages are very, very closely tied in with the adverts, which are appearing as part of the pay-per-click campaigns. Um, so what that typically means is you need to base the landing pages much more around the key phrases or keywords. So maybe to have a well-optimized campaign on pay-per-click, you might need five or even 10 different landing pages to suit the people you're uh, trying to reach. Now, there is a little bit of a way around this in the sense that you can, using technology, now get the some of the content of the landing page to dynamically change according to the key phrase or keyword that's used. But a lot of people don't use this, and even that's quite complex and uh, fiddly to do. But nevertheless, it is the next part of this. Now, what that means is that if you do things the right way, your cost per click goes right down, and Google will love you because... Um, uh, you're getting there's much more traction with the um, you know what what adverts are being placed. So your 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 rankings will be much higher as a consequence. Now a lot of people are unaware of this, so they wonder why they're literally pouring money down the drain. And remember, a click is just a click. Um, you could do some bit of retargeting uh, on some of the platforms, but the difficulty is you're still not going to know who those people are because for data protection reasons. And also because the, the, you know these platforms are keen to protect their IP, which in effect are their people um, who use their platforms, um, you, you don't know who they are. So uh, what it really is a case of doing is to get someone to take some form of action. Typically, you've got to get someone to take that form of action within the first five to eight seconds of being on your website. Um, so that means typically opting into something. Um, now, you shouldn't, should always be prepared to share lots of value up front, which doesn't require an opt-in, but you also need to have something that people can opt into so you can start to bring them into your nurturing process. So um, now we talked a little bit about this earlier on, and we also talked about, you know, how much do you really value your time? And some of those headings are in both parts, both the free and the paid for. Now, for example, about three years ago, four years ago, you could have got reasonable traction on Facebook, uh, for example, if you were to put good content out there. Um, now, it doesn't really work anymore. To the, uh, if it is, it's to a very limited degree. The reason being is they expect you to pay to play, okay? Now, at the moment, Instagram, you can put a lot of pictures out there and it gets some traction. But in order to get real traction, you potentially need to pay to play. Um, if, for example, you're talking about LinkedIn, you're posting posts and articles on LinkedIn at the moment. Now, LinkedIn does give you a reasonable amount of traction with that. But you're, what you'll notice, because a lot more people are doing it, it's really difficult to stand out now. And again, LinkedIn, over time, I've got no doubt in my mind, over the next year or so, you'll have to pay more to play, if that makes sense. So everything we're talking about here doesn't involve any form of cost for uh, paid for advertising. Uh, there is one thing I'd like to just touch on here, which um, is so unfashionable that I would argue it, it, it's that it, it's almost worth a fashion or it's almost worth looking at. And for example, you know, uh, years ago, good old lumpy mail through the post um, would actually achieve amazing results, but obviously at a disparate, a very, very high cost. Now, because very few people are doing this anymore, um, it does mean when you do some form of postal campaign, the response rates tend to be much, much higher than they used to be. Um, and especially if you put together some sort of coordinated campaign across multiple channels, um, that can really open things up. So there are a few exceptions to this, um, but it's just worth uh, sort of bearing in mind. So what we're going to show you as part of today is how from every 100 cold leads that you reach out to, you can get, attract typically 10 hot prospects. They're either asking for more information or to have sales-based conversations. There isn't any pay-per-click. We can also show you how to attract higher value clients and leverage your time to get more billable work and build an element of scale into your, your business. And a little bit more, a bit of information on LinkedIn for you. And um, 
uh, we'll stop in a moment. We'll just deal with any questions. So if you've got any questions, please do type them in the chat and we will try and make sure we address those for you. But there are 675 million people on the LinkedIn platform at the moment, of which about 25 million people are on, on, on LinkedIn in the UK alone. Uh, there's probably five or six million profiles out of that which are fairly dormant. So there's still about 19 million people. It is a num the number one business professional social network. And the other thing to bear in mind is the average person on LinkedIn earns way above the uh, national average uh, wage. Okay, And businesses that do use social media for leads coming through in a business context, so that 80% of the business comes from LinkedIn in their own the B2B space, um, it can work very well into business to consumer or business to charity space. For example, we've helped one charity to get £270,000 worth of private charters and sponsorship um, for, with what we've been doing with them. And there's another organisation we're doing some work with now where we're achieve, achieving some amazing results. And the reach can be very considerable. So but if, for example, uh, the average number of connections on LinkedIn was 400 people. I think it's probably close to 500 now, but it was, it was about 400 people. So bear in mind, um, you've got access potentially to your second and third level connections. Uh, if you've also got 400 people, that means your reach is actually 60 million people. Okay. Um, so, and the way you work that out, so if you get a calculator, just test me on it if you like, take 400, multiply by 400, and then multiply by 400 again, you get your 60 million. If you've got a bit over a thousand connections, I can try to remember the maths now, but I think it's like a, it's about 140 and 50 million. If you've got like two and a half thousand, it goes up to about half the LinkedIn network. If you've got 5,000 connections, you've probably got access to three quarters of a network. So Paul, who mentioned earlier on uh, about his 8,000 connections, one of the things we discussed with Paul is about how he can run a campaign across his first level connections, as well as his second and third uh, level connections. Uh, so, but of course, LinkedIn are not full, so they're only going to give you access to a tiny segments of those. Uh, but the way we described earlier is a way that you can really reach those golden nuggets. And because of the pandemic, uh, the engagement rates are probably higher than ever at the moment because people are tending to um, access this, um, uh, you know, when they're working from home and so on. So, um, and a quick reminder in terms of what we talked about earlier on, uh, about three quarters of profiles on LinkedIn not properly optimized. Um, and it's really important you make sure that is correct. Uh, so we'll touch on that a little bit in a moment. And um, now obviously we've slightly adjusted our timings here because we've already had the coffee break. Um, so we're going to be obviously covering these other points around here, uh, which we'll cover over the, the rest of the time we've got with us. And um, let me skip a few slides because we cover those already. Uh, we're going to now be moving on to about how you can define and own your market, uh, present yourself as the expert and the importance of not hiding, why it is important to follow the social selling blueprint, and also the importance of knowing your numbers. Um, now, before we do that, um, I think what would be good is if Raymond, in a moment, if you could very kindly come into the green room. Um, Miro, if you can make sure Raymond's okay, if Raymond doesn't join in the next minutes or so if necessary, call him in his mobile, please. That'd be yeah. lovely. Okay. Uh, and Raymond, just again, if you could make sure your tab is muted on Facebook or YouTube uh, so that we don't get an echo when you uh, join us, that would be uh, fantastic. But what we'll do is we'll carry on for a few more minutes. And um, I'm just also going to have a quick look at the chat just to see whether there's um, any more points being made here. I can see, obviously, Paul is having a bit of a chat with people here. Uh, right. Yeah, um, Thomas. Thomas asked, "Are the kits imported uh, from the EU?" Um, and I can't find the reply. But Paul said they are actually made in Japan. Yeah, and I think I believe as well. I'm sure Paul will correct me on this. I'm wrong, but I believe that one of the people behind these kits is uh, a professor involved with the Oxford uh, vaccine. But don't hold me to that because that's it's not, you know Paul is the person you need to speak to. Um, yeah. So uh, so let me just have a look here. Uh, okay, so, so Thomas posted this, Rupert, when you were talking about the um, sort of offering you have and, and at the other end of the scale, giving away a free book or having a book for the value of five or ten pounds. So Thomas has posted this. Yeah, lovely. So it works the same as yeah. us like ourselves. We have invested £10,000 in software, completed custom entries. And uh, Thomas, I'm betting that you probably almost got your investment back already. Um, certainly that's typically what happens with technology if the platform you know if it's a good 
piece of software you've invested money in, usually the return on investment is in, can be incredibly quick if it's a well-designed piece of software. And in light of what's happened with uh, uh, Brexit recently and that now having been uh, done, no doubt you're very pleased you've actually put that in place. Uh, Renata's making some comment about whether you've frozen or not. So, Miral, are you real? <laughs> Um, yeah, he, have I frozen or was I praying? Um, <laughs> and when I explained, no, I haven't frozen, he was so pleased that I do, <laughs> I do have life in me still. Oh, dear, dear. Anyone who knows Renata, by the way, has got, is, um, has got uh, an amazing sense of personality. But you have to, I'm sure as Renata would say himself, would have to be a little bit unique to understand it. But uh, yeah. we all love Renato, so uh, keep going. Uh -huh. keep... um, right, okay. So Raymond is in the, uh, the hot seat now. Uh, so let's uh, bring Raymond in. So Raymond, nice to see you. Yeah, I could ask you all the lovely things about whether you had a great Christmas and New Year. Hopefully everything did go for you okay. Now we've got no audio at the moment. Uh, let me just, uh, you need to unmute your microphone, Raymond. I think Raymond's having the same problem. Oh, you probably muted your, um, I know what you think you've done. You might have muted your microphone on your computer, what you need to do is to mute things on, you may mute it on uh, elsewhere. Just try and, oh, there we go, we got you, lovely. So Raymond, uh, how were things over Christmas and New Year? Uh, relatively quiet, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, so so, so uh, why was no family turning up? I guess uh, you decided, yeah, I understand yeah. that. Makes now, a change really, doesn't it? <laughs> no, no, exactly, exactly. Now the reason I've asked Raymond to very kindly join in today, you've worked you work with many entrepreneurs, don't you? Especially on raise helping people to raise uh, uh business finance. Um first of all, one question I'd love to ask you is um on the business finance side, are things like bounce back loans around still or have they now disappeared into oblivion? No, well um bounce back loans i'm not so sure about c bills is definitely still around and it will be around for a few more months yeah i think they're going to both are going to sort of the end of end of april i think it i think it seems to have it does seem to have eased up um i think what it has given uh, well a tip which i've found over the last especially over the last two or three months is if anyone is having challenges getting funding because of their prior year results um because it's all a bit um, computer says no um, in terms of the process because of the extension what I'm finding with clients is we're actually filing short period accounts we've been talking to the accountants where performance if it has been improving in should improve the ability to get funding during this period leading up to um, over the next two or three months so um, some of the clients I've worked with in over the last year or so have had challenging years and therefore have found C bills in particular uh, exceptionally challenging so we've gone well as performance has got a bit better as in it hasn't lost money because of the changes they've made and everything else they're actually able to go back and approach funding again with a slightly more positive outlook okay no, that, that, that's good isn't it now c bills i think they've been more are they more aimed um or just without going to massive detail, is that aimed at companies who perhaps employ more than 40, 50 people or turnover yeah, above? It, it, yeah. it is more so, yeah. You can still get it depending on your turnover, but it's it's slightly slightly more yeah. large or small, small, medium companies. Yeah, no, good. Now, um, Raymond is one of these people who's um, incredibly patient, um, although uh, in the deep down inside, I'm sure his legs are probably running away at an incredible speed. But one way or another, you seem to show to clients, to other people, uh, the very calm side of Raymond's halt. Um, uh, so how have things been sort of going in terms of, I understand there's a bit of a celebration to be had as well in the sense that uh, murals have shared with me, you've got your LinkedIn profile very well optimised now uh, so, uh, as we speak. Uh, what's that ex experience been like for you? Well, I, I've really enjoyed going through and revisiting um, my looking at other people's profiles like yourselves, Damien's, I was just looking at Michael Roamling's as well, and actually refining my profile. But I've also been refining, in many ways, my whole proposition. And this came along, I think it's part of the reason why it's taken us a little bit of time to get to work together, uh, Rupert, is I've, it, it's come along at the right time now. I've looked at the whole my whole proposition, and this has actually come along at the right time. And I'm really looking forward to... Uh, when Mira and I catch up later in this week, how we move forward from here and how we actually get the message, the way 
the message I've got to many, many more people than just yeah. um, just my own my own network. Yeah, no, lovely. Thank you. I'm also delighted to hear that as well. So, uh, uh, but uh, Raymond, prior to obviously us getting to know each other, or you started to get uh, more involved with us, um, what have been some of your lead generation strategies in the past, and what's worked for you and what hasn't worked? Well, two. I've really had only two strategies. One is uh, referrals, yeah, which I think, and the other one is presentations, where I consistently was standing up and talking to people, talking in front of people about what I do and why I do it. That fundamentally, whilst I've posted on things like LinkedIn and Facebook and the like, I've never really been as consistent as I would like to, as I'd like to be. So I've kind of relied on who I am and me personally to um, bring clients in, which is, it's like putting the ball on the penalty spot, isn't it? It's, 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 it's pretty relatively straightforward to score a goal, but it's not actually going to score you many over a season. Yeah, <laughs> I love the analogy as well, by the way. That's that's really good, isn't it? I think it's a really interesting case in point as well, because um, uh, Raymond, in many ways, I think you be, be slightly blessed as well because because of your skill set and, uh, and also because this whole area of business finance is particularly relevant at the moment. I'd imagine you've probably been a lot more insulated from what's going on than other people. And also because you, to a large extent, were able to make a bit of a pivot as well, weren't you? So you're one of the very smart people. When we spoke in the early part of last year, you are able to take your business uh, transition into the new world we find ourselves in now. And as a consequence, you're reaping the rewards of that. Um, so it's interesting also what you're saying about the referral side as well, because... Uh, I, I think referrals are very much like the 192 bus, aren't they? Where they you get nothing for perhaps half an hour or an hour, and you get two, three all come along at once, you know. So, um, and yes. I think referrals, you know, can be the, some of the best sources of business, but it can be also a bit of a slow burn sometimes, can't it? Or uh, invariably, well, it, it's very good for infill work, but if you want to create, um, I think as you probably recognise, isn't it? It's the fact about being able to create an element of scale with what you're doing and resilience. That's obviously where having continual campaigns running in background makes uh, a massive difference. But the great thing is, uh, we can say about Raymond, I've got to know you pretty well over the last uh, six months or so, um, is the fact that I think it's the first thing is, I think it's fair to say you care passionately about your customers, don't you? Your, your customers are very much king, uh, king as far as that's concerned. And that sort of oozes from every pore in your, your body, which I think people love. People really buy into the authenticity of that. But the other part is um, you, something I know you feel very passionate about is being you know, able to take your business so it's actually bigger than you. So you ultimately do want to grow it quite a bit, don't you? So have you got some tips you'd like to feel you'd like to share with people uh, here uh, today in terms of what they possibly should be looking at or, or what sectors could be doing a lot better over the next six months or so? Well, the, the, on the tips, the one thing which never staggers to amaze me when I every time I see the slide is the third, a third, a third. Now, given I was a finance director in a professional services business for eight years, you'd think I'd really know that, wouldn't you? Because that was the whole argument with multiple partners. Um, but it's not until you actually come out and work for yourself that you actually really understand the implications of the of only working 70 or 80 days a year. Yeah. Uh, what that actually really does. So I think that's that, for me, has been one of the very, very big learnings uh, for, for for what I've seen, or for all the time that we've spoken, Rupert, to be fair. Lovely. Yeah, no, thank you very much. What was your perception of the sectors that are likely to do best as far over the next six months or so? Well, the one, the one, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting you talk about the 192 bus. The, the people I seem to be talking at the moment, are, it's very much the technology sector. And not just tech businesses, but consultancy businesses that are associated with tech as well, or those businesses who have engaged tech to um, enable their businesses far, 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 far better. Mm. So mm. it's not just tech businesses. It's almost like the pipeline of tech yeah. as well. I was talking to a facilities management business today that was utilising tech to aid their business in a, in a in a ways which I was kind of a bit shocked by. But it's it's almost not just the sector that you think it is, that you think would be really good. It's those. It's almost the, the downstream, the pipeline of those who are utilising those same services, right? Which I think is really, which I'm finding really, really interesting at the moment. 
Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, it, so, someone else said something to me. I, I don't sure Alex Rin's on call today or not, but um, Alex Rin said to me uh, a bit before Christmas, actually, he was say, made the, a really good point was um, try and find clients where, where, which themselves, they're very successful, but where their clients are really struggling. Yes. Um, and the yes. point I'm trying to make is because if they're really struggling, you'll probably find that they may be very successful, but the market's there in aren't and you'll probably find as invariably as part of that they'll also be keen perhaps to find a different demographic of clients if, in fill from what's n uh, not working now which was working in the past so um yeah that, that's lovely uh, well raymond uh, thank you very much for sharing that um i can see a few people in the chat have uh, uh raised some really good points about funding here so no doubt you'll want to um uh, actually pick up on the, some of those in, in a moment in the chat. Uh, so I'll let you have chat away behind the scenes uh, to your heart's content. Um, so Raymond, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, if it's right, we will remove you from the stream now, but if you rejoin our Facebook, YouTube live, that'd be uh, absolutely brilliant. So thank you very much for, for sharing. Yeah, thank you. No thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, so uh, Raymond's a lovely person to work with, Mira Osni. So we've uh, had a great pleasure working for a, a few months now and it's, it's been a right. such a lovely yeah. person yeah yeah so uh yeah so um anyway hopefully you guys enjoyed that so it should get the conversation going a little bit more uh, behind the scenes so so do engage and um what we'll do is we'll carry on now just also by the way those people those of you who are already existing clients by the way this new sales and marketing diagnostic which we will invite you to complete at the end i, I suggest that you may want to give this a bit of a go yourself as well even though you may be uh, clients first of all i think you'd be really interested in the questions but also it's going to help us a lot in working with you too as well so um it, so it's something we created from the ground up we piloted it uh last month we've we believe in eating our own dog meat uh by the way and the dog meat can be very nice i've been told but uh this is part of a focus group we ran in december across our, our clients and not surprising clients will always tell you what they want which was really appreciated uh, so the output from that has been fed into this new sales and marketing diagnostics. I'd be really interested to hear what you guys think a bit later on. But so moving on from that, um, uh, let's uh, so I'll just my camera's in the way. Bear me a moment. Uh, let's go on to the music slide. Now moving a little bit more onto the social media side again. Um, just a bit of a word of warning: social media. Uh, I'm stealing Google's old words or a twist on their words. There was a, a phrase that Google. I uh, used some time ago about uh, 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 do no evil. It actually didn't, wasn't exactly that, but it's along the same sort of lines. The reason I put this slide up is that some of the technologies, where it's, uh, things we're going to be sharing with you, I've already shared with you, or share with you afterwards, it does rely on people being really responsible. So, for example, if you've got a BMW car with a, you know, a really good engine in it, if you chose to grow, go through some amber or red traffic lights, then obviously we all know what could happen, the chances are you probably get away with it a few times, you may get a few tickets for it, uh, but hopefully you wouldn't be involved in an accident. Equally, of course, it could be disastrous. Um, so the same principles apply here. Of course, if you want to uh, take what we're sharing with you today and use things in the wrong way, ultimately, it's very much down to you. Uh, and obviously, common sense and good practice should always apply, and it is about building up meaningful relationships. Remember, we're all people. And it's about uh, accelerating that relationship of trust. And what I'd describe as well being, you know, going through through the first dance first, you know, especially on social media platforms, what we do see sometimes, not with our clients, but they will overtly perhaps try and sell in, you know, once someone's accepted a connection request. Um, and of course, we all know what happens in that scenario. We tend to be repulsed by people like that, or we feel very uncomfortable. And certainly we wouldn't tend to want to refer either. So there is a, it's really important you build on what we class as the currency of trust with everything we talk about here. So um, obviously we've already talked about earlier on the uh, social selling blueprint, uh, but it is about con creating consistent sales uh, month in, month out. And it's, if you can put yourselves in a place where you can fish rather than hunt, then that's, that's great as well. You'll get much better use of your time, but also you tend to develop much better relationships. Um, sort of moving on from there as well, and I think I saw, I think it was Thomas who mentioned something a bit earlier. I may have missed it in the chat. Um, but uh, 
it's really one of the reasons that people marketing campaigns can fail to work is that they perhaps outsource to organizations and they absorb themselves to of all responsibility in terms of who to reach out to. The crucial thing is we feel it's really important, even if you do engage in our full services, that you're still in control of the full sales process. Uh, we can do, we'll show you how to do all the heavy lifting. Uh, I could take that bit away from you or give you the tools here to do it. But it's really important you're in control of that because at the end of the day, that will really determine the success and also make sure you're attracting the right clients who, where you can command the right type of price for your service provision. Uh, it is about being able to create clients on demand with predictability and also get people warmed up so they're asking to have those conversations. And if you do things the right way, then you will be creating fundamentally the engine for growth. And I'll just give a couple of other case studies here, uh, just so to give you a little bit of it, about the reason behind this. Yes, of course, it's nice, it helps to uh, give you a bit of a sense of the type of organizations we've worked with. But you'll notice uh, some of the names here, like PayPal Giving. Now, that's not the banking arm, it's the charitable arm of PayPal. We, I know the CEO from the UK is also responsible for the US and Australasia. Um, and we've done some work with them, mainly on the data enrichment side. They've trusted us with their data, and we've done some work with them around that. And then obviously you can see some uh, financial services companies, some mortgage type companies in there as well. Uh, Answercom, obviously business services, legal and accounting. Um, you'll recognize that a, a new IP, a trademark, a patent attorneys, coaching trainers, consultants, technology and software companies, uh, charities and events, hospitality. Now, obviously events, hospitality is more challenging for obvious reasons at the moment, although a lot of, the, can we, a lot of that can be moved online. Um, but uh, the reason I talk about this, if you took legal and accounting, though that sector alone or sectors alone are massive. If you took coaching, consulting, massive, financial services and insurance, those sectors are massive in their own right. So this is why micro segmentation is particularly important. Um, and just also give you another feel of a different type of company. Um, Anthony Corellio and uh, Dominic Boyle, they've been better friends since the age of four uh, they actually formed a business about eight years ago um, into, in, do, uh, involved with facilities management. So they've had to completely adapt their model to a new way of working. And we've done quite a bit of work with them. And uh, they've got a fantastic team of uh, people behind them. Um, obviously, uh, it seems like the good old days now, but until March last year or February, I think the last one actually was the end of February, but to cancel the March events, um, you know, we're typically face-to-face -face and... Uh, we run through breakthrough boardrooms and all sorts of events to actually support people. Uh, we've been able to replicate a lot of that online now, and uh, we'll show you a little bit more how. But of course, what we feel is very important to people, part, part of the community, it is really about working people to help them to bring ourselves forward, amplify their brand, give them the time back. Um, and I'm going to share with you some advanced techniques in helping you to find new clients, high value clients, to have those sales based conversations. And um, we've already talked about how you can find your market i.e. avoid being a generalist, try and niche and micro-niche uh, down, have a really good suite of products, make sure at different price points. Uh, there are 147 different industry sectors on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, it's about then trying to think of the ideal avatar of clients around those. Um, you, uh, don't hide. The tendency at the moment is to get people to go into them sh their shell. Ultimately, it is about being out there, make sure your profile is well-optimized, present yourself as being the expert, and build on the credibility authenticity side. Uh, make sure your profile is well optimized, not like a CV, but it needs to lead in a little bit about you personally um, because people buy into you as a person before the company itself. Um, build on the credibility of your organization. Tap into five or six key pain points that your clients will tend to um, suffer or experience, um, and ideally do, do that as a bulletized list. Uh, offer five or six key benefits so people can get to the nub of your proposition quickly. Have some form of sales talk or diagnostic or a link to a white paper or to a video. And then repeat your contact details at the bottom. Now, why do, you might think, well, why do we put this here? Because you could do this on company pages. But company pages, bear in mind, when someone connects with you on LinkedIn, they're connecting as an individual. 
a lot of people never look at company pages on LinkedIn, or it's only a tiny percentage. So, and in effect, it, this is why, even if you haven't got a website, this can work surprisingly well. In effect, the about section of your profile, you need to think, rethink that completely uh, so that people get to the number of your proposition quickly. They can identify with a need. You Typically, you've only got someone's attention for perhaps five to 10 seconds again. So people will skim read your profile. So just make sure that people actually engage with that the right way. And also your strap line is very strong as well. And then share other um, things which are going to build on the credibility side. It's all about accelerating the relationship of trust and recommendations. Endorsements count for nothing on LinkedIn. Um, it's like collecting pebbles on a beach. But if you are focused on recommendations, uh, you know, give, offer to give people recommendations so you've got a great working relationship with. And LinkedIn is very good for encouraging uh, reciprocity. I can never say that word. But if you can get people to give you recommendations for work you've done well for them, that actually carries uh, quite a bit of weight. So it's well worth bearing, bearing that in mind. Um, obviously, follow the social selling blueprint, which we covered already. Um, and uh, so let's take a little bit of an example. Uh, let's take uh, Jane or Bob, who's running a software technology company. Um, uh, and that, let's say Jane and Bob are trying to reach directors, CXOs, partners, owners of organizations. And let's say it was within a 100 mile radius of central London, uh, New York or Edinburgh, you know, wherever they live they may, or where they operate from, you select your distance. A postcode, by the way, and distance is a lot better than putting location in. Uh, LinkedIn will miss a lot of opportunities you base it on a location, whereas you base it on a zip code or a postcode and distance is a lot better. And let's say you wanted to reach your second and third level connections, then again, you can specifically do that. And also key phrase, key words um, can make all the difference. So for example, with Paul earlier on, obviously he's got a very niche product, albeit uh, suitable for a very large market. So he needs to be able to reach people with certain types of job title or descriptions in their profile to be able to really narrow down the right people to reach out to. Again, with Raymond, you would be a victim of your own success as far as it's concerned because there are lots of businesses that need finance, but it's about finding the right people. So by using key phrases, key words, that stands you in good stead. And obviously using something like Sales Navigator on LinkedIn, uh, you can do your search and really narrow things down. Um, and you may be asking yourself, well, why use uh, Sales Navigator, not LinkedIn Premium? Well, LinkedIn Premium, um, they added Linda in, which is the learning part to Premium a while back when Microsoft came along about three years ago. But they also took out some of the core functionality from LinkedIn Premium. Um, so, uh, and some of them are quite um, important parts. So, yes, you can do a certain amount on LinkedIn Premium. But for an extra $10 or pounds per month, it's really a no-brainer between the two. Um, it's a bit more complex to use. But again, we will actually show you how to use it if that interests you. And this is an example of a, a prospect nurturing process. Now, uh, this process will vary from one person and company to another. But in principle, I'm sorry, I've sent that to voicemail. I forgot to mute my phone, which is not good or best still switched off. Um, is, uh, is when you're reaching out to people, the connection request message, the most important part with that is to for the person to actually accept your connection request. You, If they have to look at your profile, that's a bonus. But in a sense, if they become, accept your connection request because you would have pre-selected them already, then you'll know you're reaching your right, the right people. So the objective has to be to, for the person to accept the connection request. Once they do, they're in your network. They're very easy to reach from that point onwards. Um, the big difference between email and using something like LinkedIn is, first of all, there's almost a 100% deliverability rate on LinkedIn, uh, whereas email, you might find the deliverability rate is, uh, you might think it's 100%, but it might be it might be 35 40 45%, the deliverability. The open rate could be anything from like 2% up to 25%. Here, you're talking about 30 to 50% acceptance rate then the open the deliverability rate in all those messages is pretty well 100%. It's the um, it's what then people do after that point onwards. So what you'll find is for every 100 people you reach to, by the time you've gone through each part of that process, you'll find roughly 10 people out of every 100 will be either asking for more information 
part of a sales-based conversation. Now, for example, if Raymond, uh, sorry, not Raymond, uh, well, he is Raymond, but um, if you took Paul as a case in point, he's got a very niche uh, product, albeit a very wide market appeal, okay? So if uh, Paul gets his targeting right, he may well find his um, uh, figure is much higher than 10% at the bottom, okay? Um, in other cases where someone is very much presents themselves as being a generalist, goes about it wrong, obviously the percentages can be uh, a bit lower. But it's just worth bearing that in mind. And for example, in email, if you manage to get a click-through rate of anything from 2% to say 10 or 15%, you're doing really well. When we talk about 10% here, this is not a click-through rate. These are people who already determine there's an element of interest there and they're actually asking for an official sales-based conversation. So it's not it's comparing Apple with pairs. So the difference here is you're reaching out to people in your target market and much higher engagement rates. So it is much easier to fish if you do things the right way. Um, so let's look at some key numbers around this uh, as well. Um, so just being a second, I lost my mouse pointer. Um, and if we look at the sales optimization uh, system, as a case in point. Now, this, uh, these figures are just obviously example figures, but I'll explain why I'm going through this in just a moment, because it will start to become self-evident. But let's say your core proposition, your core value of average value of sale over one year uh, per client was 10,000 pounds or dollars, okay? Um, and allowing for churn, the fact that not everyone will stay on for three years, let's say over three years, the same clients uh, generated a total over a three-year period of $25,000 of dollars. And then allowing for the fact you may lose some more clients in years four and five, um, but equally they may give you more business, uh, as others are giving you more business. Let's say over the same client over five years on average is worth $35,000 or dollars, okay? So these are just imaginary numbers. So and, and this, this would be quite typical of an accountant that's got a reasonable client. Um, equally for a software technology company, uh, this could be similar. I do know of companies where they've got reverse churn. So in other words, instead of, they may lose some customers along the way, but what they do is they, the those customer, customers they've got actually refer other people in or they upgrade. So it is quite possible to have reverse churn. More typically, it's the other way around. And let's say uh, you wanted to reach... Um, have three more clients per month, so that's 36 per year, then based on these numbers, that would actually uh, generate, those those 36 people from a 12-month campaign would generate you £360,000 worth of revenue. Now, does that mean they're all coming in the first year? No, because, of course, if you reach out into someone in month 11, then the sale will probably come into the second year, okay? But the point I'm trying to make there is if you took the same clients as part of a 12-month campaign, They've got the potential, based on these numbers, to generate you uh, nine hundred thousand pounds over three years, or dollars, or, or the equivalent of one point two six million. Now, those numbers, if you're a really small business, may be off the Richter scale. But whatever your numbers are, just replace them instead. And we've got a special calculator which we can go through individually, with people, if they want to. But I just want to take this calc, extrapolate this a different way. Um, and the reason I've shown this as well is this thing about a perceived flight to safety. People can perceive that when the market's a bit temperamental, like it is at the moment, um, that they better try and preserve cash rather than actually taking decisive action. So let's say you decided you wanted to grow your turnover, which currently, let's say, was standing at 250,000 a year at the moment, and you wanted to grow it to 400,000 pounds a year. Um, basically, the monthly lost opportunity cost of take by taking no action would be twelve thousand five hundred pounds. So basically, um, if nothing changes, I would say normally everything stays the same. But in fact, is that actually true? Is it a case we're going backwards um, based if we took no action? Let's show you the same two hundred fifty thousand a different way. Um, so I just realised I lost my mouse pointer again. Um, Let's took it another way, and let's took the two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. You want to grow it to four hundred thousand pounds? I think we'll just get the calculator again. Don't believe me on these figures. Just get a calculator and be able to work it for yourself. That would result in a loss of opportunity cost of twelve thousand five hundred pounds per month. If you can, you took no action, and let's say you actually lost customers, 
or the customers that you got perhaps turned a bit bad or couldn't pay you. Um, in fact, the lost opportunity cost isn't £12,500, it's £19,375 per month. So the, the risk of failure or things going wrong if you take no action can be far worse, uh, or in fact, can be decidedly negative uh, for your business. In fact, even affecting its survival by taking no action. Whereas if you took decisive action to move forwards, it can put you in a really good place. Now, I'm going to share this slide with you, which I did have to um, slightly smile at, um, actually, because this is Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel. And he talks about bad companies are destroyed by a crisis, good companies survive them, and great companies are improved by them. Now, the reason I slightly smile at this is, whilst I 100% agree with this quote, um, the interesting thing, of course, is Intel themselves have got their own challenges at the moment. Uh, they are an example of a company, and of course, the risk of being sued here, which uh, I think we're too small for them to worry about, but uh, uh, I'm not going to, um, to knock them in any shape or form, because of course, they've got great products. But the difficulty is they're great products years ago, or even fairly recently, but they are rapidly being overtaken now. So you only need to look at, um, I think it's ARM, if I got this correct. Uh, look at what Apple have done. They've introduced a new range of computers now with a new M1 chip, which is not an Intel chip inside. And um, I won't get into Apple's claims, but let's put it this way. I can vouch for the fact that their new M1 chip, because we've personally got one of these now, um, is infinitesimally faster than some of the higher spec machines you can get out there, which are either PCs or even the previous generation of Macs, which are still being sold with Intel processors on them. And Intel is a really interesting example of a company that's perhaps stayed still. They've tried to innovate and create, but in, in reality, they've not been doing it fast enough. So um, they could find themselves actually um, really losing market share over the next 12, 18 months unless they take some radical decisions. So this quote could actually come back and haunt them. But the point I would just say here is that, you know, by innovating, creating, um, we can stay ahead, we can do be different. And um, it's about having a well oiled sales machine. So um, I, what I'll do is I'll explain this just a moment. Mural, have we got some questions that are coming up here, uh, by the way? Is there someone else here that, uh, uh, in fact, interesting, Alan, Alan, are you, you've got a phrase there which you've used, um, uh, Preact, that's cool, I, te I, I teach React. Funny enough, I know of a company called Preact. I, I think he means that he teaches Preact, I think. Uh, yes, it could well be. I'm interested to know the context behind that, uh, but I, I love that quote. Um yeah. Uh, Thomas, if you're up for coming on air, actually, obviously, uh, uh, just put a little bit in the chat because you, if you've got a really good question, um, if you've got uh, a really good uh, question, uh, do put indicate in the chat. I might bring on air. That's Thomas Eccles because uh, he obviously makes some really interesting points. So he'd be interested to know a little bit more about you. Um, and equally, if anyone else has got some points they'd like to raise, potential on air, we might be able to bring you into uh, to the live stream. Um, so, uh, so I can see some general chat has gone on here as well. Thank you for your feedback about the logo side as well. Um, so, yeah, do do that. What we'll do is I'll keep on moving um, with this. If anyone would like to put themselves forward, has got a question they'd like to come in on the live stream from. Um, right. Okay. So, Mural, can you share the link with Thomas then? Yeah, um, I've, I've just dropped him a line. More than happy to. Okay, Thomas, what I'll do is I'll drop you an email now with the link. Yeah. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, so so Thomas, when you come in, when you click that link, just make sure your YouTube or Facebook uh, video stream that you mute the audio, okay? But open up another tab. You don't need to close the tab down. Open up another tab. Click on the link. We'll see you come in the green room, and then we'll invite you in, as it were. So think of that question, um, and uh, we'll perhaps go from there. Okay, so let's uh, keep moving for the moment. So now with this um, particular slide. Um, this is a, an example of how you can have a well-oiled uh, sales machine. So uh, the first part really is to do about making sure profile is optimized the right way, that you're, you, you've determined who your ideal clients are, and you can basically narrow it down. A bit like Paul did earlier on, he talked about millions of people being in his sector, he narrowed it down to 250 as part of the first phase, okay? 
Now that involves a little bit of time, but the great thing is because Paul's uh, taken the right approach, uh, he's made sure he's going to only be reaching the people who are in his, his market niche. Then of course you can use something like what we class as biz growth time machine, which enables you to plug in this uh, three, five, seven step message process, whatever you want to do within it, and it will do the heavy lifting for you. And I'll explain that a little bit more a bit later on. And the good thing is with that, if you can get people warmed up so they're actually asking to have those conversations, then you'll be able to ultimately close more business. So this first part, we recommend either you personally or, a, or it could be a really good VA or purchase assistant helps you with the selection part of it. We'll sh we can show you what to do so you do that in the right way. The second part is where we recommend using technology orbit with you being in control and also with you using human intervention where appropriate to take over those conversations so um, everything is always done in an appropriate way. And then as people start to engage, want more to have more conversation, they drop into the sales optimization process that is where, again, your skills or the skill of your business development managers um, will be able to then close those opportunities down. So um, we've already talked about Michael Romney a bit earlier on. A few quick, few other quick case studies. Um, Lorna Leonard is the interim financial director, uh, a real introvert. She um, is one of these people who is brilliant at her job, um, but... Uh, Speaking to clients, she will do very well in a very professional way, but she's not very comfortable doing it. But she was using the methodology we trained her with here because people were actually asking to have conversations. She managed to pick up a 30K client in the first 10 days of working with us. I wouldn't say that's normally quite as fast as that, but it does happen. Uh, Susanna Schofield, I've done a lot of work with her. her. She's uh, got an OB for a service to Queen and Country. Um, and we've already talked about PayPal giving. We do a lot of work with helping them to enrich their charity uh, databases. And Jubilee Selling Trust was the charity I mentioned earlier on where we'd help them to raise £270,000 worth of sponsorship and private charters. Again, the reason I'm also sharing these with you is it gives you the an extent of the reach that you can have with all these uh, good things. Um, so, and then if we look at this part here, in times of massive dis market disruption, um, it really is about adapting to the new market and having business growth in mind, building on tribes, having a really well-oiled uh, oiled sales machine, and um, uh, if reflecting what may break you. Uh, whatever you do, don't scale what may break you because it will just break things twice as fast or three times as fast. But if you can scale what's going to work or what's working, then, of course, that's really good. And then look at what you can do once and use technology uh, to dramatically increase your reach and sales. And obviously, we're clearly here to support you in that. And we obviously do that through uh, these main things. Obviously, a lot of this has moved to more of an online model, at least for the moment. Um, and we're very keen to people feel part of everything we do. And um, what we'll do is, I think at this point, it'd be really nice to bring uh, Thomas in uh, as well. So, um, so Thomas, uh, welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, we can hear you as well. Let me just uh, change the view. There we go. So, Thomas, tell us a bit about yourself, because I think this is um, you know, the first time we've spoken there. Have you spoken with me all before or not? I believe we spoke on the phone this morning, but that was about it. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit more uh, about what you do, Thomas, and what's your real passion and interest? Well, I'm the managing director of a career company. Um, it's called Career Crew. We started off back in October 2019. Um, and since then, we've just been growing and evolving. We started off as a man with a van, uh, just doing odd jobs here and there while I was in between work. And then decided that I was going to invest a bit of money and, and grow. And uh, we got to the stage of having four vehicles, five drivers, two office staff. And then... Um, and then we've decided now that we're actually going to get into the freight forwarding market. And we decided that back in August last year. And only now has everything finally gotten into place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. So is it just yourself as the sole director with your team? Or have you got a business partner who works with you? Uh, no, it's just myself that runs it. Um, right. Yeah. I, I must be. I love speaking with people like yourself, Thomas, because you're – like the new breed of entrepreneur is coming through, which comes up with a brilliant idea, innovates, adapts to the market, creates something that's really exciting, and obviously getting good results. So uh, 
Uh, fantastic. So we're very well done on that. Um, what have been some of your strategies for growth at the moment? Where have you mainly got your clients from? And what have been some of the good sources of finding clients? Uh, so when we first started out uh, as a man with a van, I, it was a lot of phone calls, a lot of, hey, we're new, posting on Facebook, you know, do you need to move something? And then eventually it got to the point where people started contacting us. Right. So I want to order 5,000 biscuits from Orkney once, and I want them in Aberdeen tomorrow. Can you do that? And I'm lying in bed at 11 o'clock at night and going, well, I suppose I can do. <laughs> and um, sorry, let me just mute that. And, uh, and then we grew uh, slowly but surely. I didn't have the funds to put anything into marketing. Um, this was back. We joined the FSB, and I thought, 125 pounds, that's going to be, oof. <laughs> Yeah, and um, and then we created the market essentially for importing into the Highlands, because the Highlands is a huge importer and exporter to and from the EU, uh, and where where I live is very <clears throat> tourism orientated. Eighty percent of tourism, I believe, at least it was four years ago, <laughs> uh, was from Germany alone. Right. where I live, which is in the heart of the Cairngorms, about half an hour south of Inverness. Wow. So you live in Scotland, Thomas, now? Yeah. Oh. yeah. It doesn't sound it, does it? I've lived here my whole life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> exactly. No, that's very good. And uh, obviously, you 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 know, you've it's a lot of hard graft what you've done. Obviously, you've been not being frightened of picking up the phone and speaking uh, with people and clearly you're meeting a, a need. Um, what have been some other good strategies for you to bring in, bring in business? Confidence is definitely key when you're bringing something new and a bit alien to people, which is the best way, way we've found to describe it um, to people that know about the logistics of freight industry. Having something come into our area, I mean, the village where our office and warehouse is, I think there's 800 people that live there. And right. then the next one down, it's 2,000 people and then 600. And so it's very small. And when we said we're going to be a freight forwarder, people went, Ooh, what's that <laughs> and so we basically just had to go around phone people knock, knock on doors and explain look this is what we do put it into basic terms as possible travel agent for boxes <laughs> <laughs> and um and explain to them because our, our market has come in from brexit right um, because that, they do so much trade with the brexit's helped you ironically enough or not or is that going too far I won't say Brexit's helped because that might annoy some people because <laughs> we did get some interesting phone calls when uh, the Press and Journal put a release out up here um, with me featuring it saying that we're taking full advantage of uh, Brexit and people were phoning us saying, oh, so you want Brexit, this, that, and the other. And we're like, no, we actually don't because <laughs> the trade union was probably the best thing economically for the UK. And the deal they've got now with the, the no tariffs is brilliant for businesses. Right. Because uh, when the freight comes in, it there's no tariffs needing to be paid on it, so your duty. So it hasn't gone to the worst case scenario of World yeah. Trade Organization rules. But creating the market was relatively simple for us. It was the, work, the hardest part about it was getting the point across that people needed to prepare. Right. And 80% 80, 80 of the people we spoke to did nothing. Right. And now they're phoning up in panic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, well, well, very well done for positioning yourself in that way as well. And I think it does bear up the point, as making it a bit earlier on, that uh, yes, we're in the middle of a the dreaded P word, as it were. Uh, but the other side of it is the fact that one major uncertainty at least has gone. You know, whether, whether someone is for uh, Brexit, uh, leaving or, or against that at least one major uncertainty is gone. So that we can forget about that now. We can concentrate yeah. on, yeah, uh, allegedly, of course, we don't know what paperwork is going to be involved. And, you know, probably things that blow up in our face later on. But the bottom line is that the big part, the big one of the two, two big elephants has gone. The, the, the other one, of course, is the big C word or pandemic. <laughs> um, at least the good thing is that you're a really good example of where you've been able to take advantage of the market in a positive way you have be able to create something which is very much of this time. And uh, no, very well done on that, Thomas. I'm, I'm very pleased uh, for you. So very much keep in touch. And obviously fill in that question at the end as well, because I'd love to have a conversation with you. So, Thomas, 
yeah. could, could I ask something? It's, it's quite personal, and I know Rupert is far too polite. Can I ask <laughs> How old am I? Yes. <laughs> I am 18. You're joking. Um, well, well, well done, you. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I, I think I'll be Tom, 19 in January. <laughs> well, we are in January now. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, Tom, for being, uh, uh, first of all, I think we should give you a £20 Amazon voucher off, off the back for that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think it's amazing as achievements as well. So, yeah, yeah I'm not taking away from Paul Raymond here, but, uh, you know, you've, you've been able to achieve a lot, so well done. Um, well, nothing's, nothing's impossible if you put your mind to it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, well, you're, 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 unfortunately, you'll be paying for everything that we're going through now for years to come. You're the, the next generation. Good luck with that one. <laughs> um, yeah, no, exactly. So, Thomas, if so, okay, I'll return you back to the stream again. You know how to uh, go back. Yeah, again. Right. All right. So thank you very much, Thomas. Thank uh, you very much. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, as I say, thank you um, for that. And also for Paul and Raymond Olon. If anyone else would like to put themselves forward um, as well. Um, so, uh, for example, Alan, you've been making a few comments here um, as well, and uh, yes, yeah, so do, 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 do engage, uh, put something in the chat if you want to join us, we can perhaps bring you in in a minute. Um, but anyway, let's uh, carry on for the moment, and um, we're actually doing very well for time, I'm pleased to say, so uh, we're, we're definitely running to time, if not ahead of time. Um, so, right, here we go. So, we've already... We covered this part already. So moving a little bit on from here, we've already talked as well about um, the opportunities you can create for yourself as well. And um, and we've already talked about this as well. It is really about being vital. It's absolutely vital you're able to leverage what you do and rise above the noise. And, uh, and it basically it is about either investing your time or investing money or both. And... Um, uh, what we've already talked about is everything you do in terms of elevating your brand, bring your sales forward and leveraging technology to give your time back. And uh, we personally got a great, um, uh, a great, uh, you know, uh, we don't know how to make a difference. And um, it, it really is about doing these things. And what we're very keen to do is to work with you to show you how using the right methodologies and systems, you can achieve a uh, great uh, results. And, um, so, and we've already explained the importance of being able to do the job once uh, and to create the content, repurpose it and amplify it many times and how you can plug into a solution in a box if you want to do so um, and uh, what you'd like to put in place to leverage the entire marketing sales uh, process. Um, now, your foundations, we've touched a, bit, a little bit on this earlier on about your markets and marketing mix to make sure you've got it right in your products and products portfolio. It is also important to make sure you've got your social selling uh, blueprints right. Um, so in terms of some of what we have to offer, in terms of their packages, and I'm, obviously today is about sharing massive amounts of value. So while I will touch on this for perhaps three or four minutes, um, it is about making sure you get what you want out of today. But I will just explain briefly the top um, red or orange circle where we talk about biz growth easy start. That is the part where if you want help on optimizing your LinkedIn profile, understanding the correct, the best five message process, um, how best to, uh, what strategy you can put in place to make sure that you bring a really strong lead flow of opportunities coming through. And also you can be part of a, a rolling program over the next 13 weeks um, where we help you on the branding, the product side, and the marketing side to get the right... The Biz Growth Easy Start is a really good place uh, to begin with. If you also want to amplify your brand um, and be able to create content once, but possibly through a live stream or a video, and then repurpose it multiple times, so you can re get really real exposure out there without, again, having to pay for it, as it were, then what we class as a Biz Growth Accelerator package, which is this one on the left, is great because not only do you get the um, Easy Start within it, it's also a 12-month package. It's an extensive package that we run over 12 months with you where you get um, you plug into eight different sessions on each one of those parts we cover within that uh, circle, as it were. And so you'll be working with others as well. And we also plug you into two breakthrough strategy sessions on top of that. So that's that's very good for those people who don't really want to plug into perhaps the time machine, as we would call it, 
uh, but they do want to benefit from the the, you know, the top part, the easy start, and the accelerated part. The biz growth premier part um, again incorporates easy start, and we give you the uh, laptop, we give you the solution in the box, which I'll explain a bit more how that works in a moment. Um, but you don't get the accelerator part, in order. you get a tiny bit of it, but it's the main part. It's actually focusing on helping you to win more business through LinkedIn and use automation to help you along the way. Then that's a great package to go for. If you want the, everything, including the kitchen sink, which is everything I've described here, then we've got the ultra package, which is the one that sits right in the middle. OK, and a bit of tongue in cheek, a bit of a play on back to the future. But because we are generally helping you to bring sales forward um, give you, and get you, help you to get your time back with uh, the option of the Amplify Your Brand part of it, we say rather tongue in cheek, you're part of the Time Travelers Club. OK, and um, uh, so because and it's a bit of a play on back to the future as well, but uh, probably giving away my age there. But anyway, that's an, uh, another point. Um, so. Uh, We've already talked a little bit about the easy start part of it, so I don't plan to go this in any real detail. Um, the If you want to join, you can join for as little as £997 on that plus VAT. Uh, we can offer the instalment option. So it's a very good way to come in. And if you were to upgrade within the first 30 days or so, we actually give you that money back as an offset um, against uh, what you are upgrading uh, to. Um, now, I... Obviously, we've already talked about the Amplify Your Brand part of it. In effect, there, that is about creating um, your content. Um, ideally, you start off, you don't have to start with a video to start with or a video interview. But if you've got a really good video interview, or we might be able to show you how to, we'll show you how to go about that. Um, then, of course, that's great to be able to then um, uh, repurpose it, re edit it, republish that again through the social channels. And then how you could take an edited version, down, turn that into a podcast and use the different technology platforms uh, to get it out there, you know, through Spotify, Amazon and or oh, sorry, I think it's the Alexa, sorry, uh, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts, for example. And how you can then get that message out there through social media, what you can put in place to run online events if you want support with that um, and what you can put in place to run webinars. Um, webinars can be really good in terms of sharing value. And if you can build an element of automation there, again, that's really good. But it's always about being authentic so that people know that it is something which has been pre-recorded, although we can show you ways to make it in a surprisingly interactive to the extent that people forget it's, a, um, it's a, a, like an on-demand webinar. They actually feel they're part of it and part of the whole experience. Um, it's also about taking the same content, which you start from the very top, and how you can get that transcribed and use that to create articles and posts and what you can put in place in the way of a, a diagnostic tool uh, to, as a, a, that can be used in multiple ways. So you can use that, first of all, as a pre-sales device to make sure it's a really good fit for you um, and they're going to work well with you as a client and the other way around. But also it's a way of sharing value once they do become uh, 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 clients as well. And then if you want to develop the learning part as uh, the whole thing, then that's great. Now, uh, this is, um, it's not a full how-to uh, experience because clearly it would mean that we'd have to price things out of reach of most people. Um, but what we'd do is in each one of those, we'd get you started. And because you'd be working as a group collectively with other people, you'll have the benefit of being able to leverage from their experience as well and as much as possible, we try and encourage people to buddy up too so that people can help themselves behind the scenes. And it all ties in with the overall community part of um, everything um, that we're sort of doing. And this is basically what the time machine includes. Um, so what we do is we literally give you the laptop. Um, we give you some software, which is not surprisingly called BizGrowth Time Machine. Um, that helps you to automate your LinkedIn lead generation campaigns, but the big thing is that you're in full control. And that's really, really important because that is the part that helps you to guarantee the success of what you're doing. Um, it's very, very easy to use. It's, it's behind the scenes, it's a very sophisticated product. As far as the front end, front end is concerned, it's not a geeky product. Um, there are some tools out there you can use, which to be frank, you could very easily get yourself into trouble with um, now, I, I'm okay with this, and possibly Mural would be too, but you do have to have a geek mindset. <laughs> uh, with this, you don't. It's designed to protect you from the environment. And because it would be 
um, acting almost as a front end to what you'd be doing on uh, LinkedIn with you in full control, you can actually live more or less within that interface. So yes, we still recommend going to LinkedIn to a degree, but actually you're able to use this more or less to manage your campaigns. And by using the messaging process, we'd recommend, you know, again, your wording, but the messaging process, that's how you can get the consistent with the leads coming in month of, month out. Obviously, you'd be segmenting people on in LinkedIn itself, and um, you'd be taking the, the URL that comes from that to embed that within the technology platform. Uh, now, this is a bit driven by uh, compliance, okay? Um, so I have to be a bit careful what I say here, but uh, let's put it this way. If you run a campaign across your first level connections, we can actually show you how you can build up your email list. Now, there's a whole ring around GDPR and doing things in the right way. Um, so it's heavily caveated, this part of it. But uh, what you do end up is with a lot of extra uh, information which enables you to reach out and engage with people. And if you want to build in hyper-personalization of messaging, which incorporates a video, sorry, uh, a photograph and a personalized message within the photograph, got the capability to do that. And literally, it would, and I, we know this because we had a team of people in the Philippines doing this. Um, basically, uh, if we were running a full campaign, for example, like Michael Romling, we were running a full campaign in about 12 months, for 12 months, and he's now moving over to the new Biz Growth Time Machine, um, we were spending three to five hours a day just on his campaign, okay? And that's over 12 months. So with this, that reduces it down to about 15 to 30 minutes a day, but with you in full control. So the moment that people reach out and want to engage with you, uh, then you're taking full control of those so that you're taking people off the platform and can turn those into uh, meaningful conversations. Um, so, and the ultra package, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because I've illustrated in general terms here, but that this literally includes um, everything that's in all the packages, which includes the Biz Growth Time Machine. It also includes the whole expand your brand part of it. Um, what we're doing on this, um, and this came from our focus group in December, uh, because we've got a number of people already um, on our Biz Growth Ultra package, okay, is what we decided to do um, is for those new clients coming on board is uh, effectively you would be paying for a year but would give you actually six months uh, free on top. Now, the reason we're doing this is um, because it's a very, it's all like an all-encompassing program. We want people to get a, a fast return on investment. So we'll focus on the parts for you, with you, which are going to give you your fastest return on investment. And typically, that's around the LinkedIn piece, around the Biz Growth Time Machine. And the expand your brand part of it, or amplify your brand part of it, is a nice thing that fits around that. But because we don't want people to feel rushed with it, we're actually giving new clients the opportunity to come in uh, based on the fact that uh, they, they've got 18 months to do what is really a 12 month program. Okay, and that means that rather than you feel you've got to rush anything you're doing, you're able to get the maximum value that you can over that period. Um, so, um, and uh, so that's obviously as part of the special terms that come on. So as a quick um, recap, and again, if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask, please do ask away. And I so say we are running well to time, so in fact we'll probably run finish a bit early. Um, this is what we've covered, helping you to bring yourselves forward, amplify your brand uh, for growth, leverage technology. Uh, we talked about your marketing, marketing mix, um, how to maximize ourselves through LinkedIn. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, give you a very quick demo. I'm not going to give you a physical demo of the platform because, again, I want to make sure we stick to time. But I've got a few uh, slides for you just to make it a bit easier. I'd like to give you an opportunity to complete the diagnostic as well. Um, we've got uh, another uh, competition associated to that. So a quick, a few quick screen grabs. Um, as you can see here, um, this is the Biz Growth Time Machine. This is, at the front here, gives you some really good stats of how well your campaign is actually doing. Okay, and you can have uh, up to two simultaneous campaigns. So you can be running a campaign to your first level connections, and you can be running a campaign to your new uh, people that you're reaching out to. So you can do that simultaneously through this. Um, and uh, moving on from that, um, this screen here, where you've got these like uh, cyan colored uh, dots or lines, each one of these symbolizes a message. So this person's three, three messages into the process. This one is four, that one's five, 
that's three, that's six. Okay. In this case, because it's for ourselves, um, we're doing a seven message campaign because we like to share a lot of value up front. Um, okay. But that's down to you. The good thing is because once you set this up to run a campaign over four messages or seven or five, it doesn't, once it's set up, you really, it doesn't really take any more effort. That's the nice thing with using this technology. But the big thing is that you're in control. So the moment someone actually engages and they want to have a conversation with you, the, the campaign will automatically stop for that one person so that you have a chance to personally reply. And you've then got the option of dropping into the rest of the campaign, um, which we'd recommend not normally doing. Um, if someone's engaged, they want to have a conversation, what we recommend is at that stage, you try and get this person off the platform as quickly as possible because you're much more likely to convert them, okay, because they're already interested. It's about seizing the moment. And then on this part here is a bit more detailed explanation over the stats. Um, you can't really see it very well here, but you do get a breakdown of how mess messages it's sent out per day, how many over the last month, how many people responded to the messages, how many follow-up messages have been dealt with, and it gives you a breakdown based on the uh, campaign. So it's a, you know, it's a very easy system to use. Um, and uh, uh, so what I'd very much like to encourage you to do, unless someone's got some more questions, gladly stop for a few questions. Um, what I'd very much like to encourage you to do is to complete what we class the sales marketing uh, diagnostic. Um, if you're an existing client, I know we've got several clients on this call today, um, then uh, I'd still ask you or suggest that you do this, actually, because as part of our next call with you, we'll go through that with you and its findings. You will get an instant uh, results, by the way, but we also can email you separately as part of that call a, a PDF report. Um, if this is the uh, – what we'd love to do as well is to have a – give you an option to book in a free strategic, strategic review call or discovery call with me on Mural, uh, and we can discuss these findings together. Um, clearly, you have got a very low cost way in through the um, Easy Start package, which you've described there, and you've got the option of the Ultra package. So, um, and then we've, as part of this diagnostic, uh, what we will do is um, we're, we're going to give away uh, three Amazon vouchers. Okay, there's going to be a fifty pound Amazon voucher for the um, prize winner and two runner ups of twenty pounds each. Uh, now, if there's a tie. We might have to roll over to Thursday uh, for our live stream, uh, but hopefully we'll get a clear win. This is what the report uh, not looks like, but um, in effect, that you get an, a form of output like this um, as, as a separate exercise. We'd then email you the uh, PDF, which um, is if you were to keep. And um, what I'd suggest you do, Meryl, could you very kindly paste the two links there uh, into the chat? Yeah, that... will do. Yeah, uh, so there's two links here. There's one which is uh, businessgrowthbureau.tv. I've highlighted that green because um, um, we've uh, moved on to a new domain now. So it's .tv uh, forward slash diagnostic, okay? Um, and the second one is to book the phone call in. Now, actually, when you complete this, uh, give you a little um, insider tip, as it were, when you complete the diagnostic, it will come up with a report a bit like it does on the uh, right-hand side, of here. Um, if you scroll down that page, there is a link to actually book in a course. You can either click the link there and book in the um, call uh, for you. So it's really a two step process. So, um, with that in mind, if you could very kindly open up a second tab, leave this tab open, um, and actually start the diagnostic. What I'm going to do so people don't feel rushed, it should only take about six or seven minutes to complete because it's virtually all yes no questions. There are a few other ones in there. Sorry, yes, no questions, and they're randomized because that way you, you know, go more by an intuitive response that you don't need to overanalyze each question, go more by a intuitive response, and at the end, you'll get a screen like you have on the right hand side. Um, and uh, w what we'll do is we'll see all those uh, come through. Um, if we feel people need a bit more time, we'll, we'll give people a bit more time to complete it. So, um, now. Uh, what I'd probably suggest is just in the background while you're doing this, uh, just listen to some classical music or whatever you're into. And uh, what we'll do is we'll reconvene at, um, say, about one or two minutes past five. Okay, so it gives everyone about six or seven minutes. Um, if I can see people are still completing it, we will actually give you a chance to wait. So don't feel rushed over this. Uh, but you might need, you know, six or minutes. You might need ten, um, but more typically six or minutes. And... Uh, 
And also you can book the course straight in from the calendar system from that, uh, uh, that link. Um, okay, so uh, we'll, we'll let you uh, do that now. I'm gonna just shut up for a few minutes to leave you in peace and quiet. Uh, Mira, well, Mira and I will be behind the scenes. If you've got any questions, just type them in the chat and we'll answer those for you. Um, but I'll mute my um, uh, camera and mic for a few minutes and we'll all do the same and we'll rejoin you. We'll still rejoin you at about two or three minutes past five. Okay. And we'll see how you're all getting on. Okay. Uh, so see you again in a few minutes. Okay.
Hello, good afternoon. Um, just to say that uh, don't panic or feel rushed. Uh, I can see about half of you have already completed the uh, uh, diagnostic questionnaire, which is absolutely fantastic. There are another two or three people, actually a bit more than that, I think it's about uh, four or five people, which I can see are about two thirds of the way through. So what we'll do is we'll give everyone a few more minutes, so don't feel rushed. Um, also, if you'd like to um, uh, book in a call with myself or Miral to go through this report, because obviously what we will have got behind the scenes in, in here will give you over an overall score, as it were, against each category. But behind it, we'll also have all the individual answers so we can go through these with you and determine what is most important as part of the strategy call. So what I would suggest you do is just make sure you click when you finish the diagnostic questionnaire, if you could uh, just click the um, other link, which is businessgrowthbureau.tv forward slash call. And you can then book a call in myself or with Mural, and we can go through into a lot more detail uh, what's right for you. Don't feel obligated to make any form of purchase with this because it is about sharing value. Uh, sometimes people are ready to do things straight away. Other times uh, people need a bit more time. Uh, so, But just do feel free uh, to book in that call as you deem appropriate. So I'm going to leave you all alone for the next uh, three minutes or so. Uh, so I'll come in again about... Um, eight minutes past five okay uh, so i'll see you again in just a few moments and we'll also have the uh, the draw or the competition as well cheers
Hello, everyone, again. Um, we are almost done. We've got two more people who've got to complete their details. And I can see in both cases, people are very close to completion of uh, the, the sales marketing diagnostic questionnaire. So don't, don't worry, we're actually, we're still running way ahead of time. So I'll give everyone another perhaps three or four minutes, well, two or three minutes uh, to complete it. Um, I can see also several of you already booked calls in, uh, which that's great. So th well done for that. And um, both, both myself and Mira will be uh, helping with that over the next few days. Uh, so, if, so if you would like to book a call in, uh, do do that via the link. And uh, we'll be very pleased to have a conversation with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it till 12 minutes past five. And we'll probably be in a position to close the competition then. And I know one, one of the prize winners is already, but I'm going to keep that to myself just at the moment, simply because uh, something will become very obvious very soon. Uh, but to be ready for the next part of the competition, there's a bit of a few fun Amazon vouchers to, uh, to give away. All right, so I'll see you again at tw 12 minutes past five. We'll come back on air again. Cheers. Hello, good afternoon, everyone again. Right, I th everyone has now completed the diagnostic questionnaire. So thank you all of those of you who've chosen to take part uh, as well. Uh, it's been quite exciting this, because I've been watching behind the scenes what you, um, as, a, as the people complete the results. I don't know the individual breakdown of the scores uh, yet, but I do know um, a few other things which we'll share with you. Um, so that's really appreciated. And um, what I'd like to do as part of the competition, we need to be ready to make some notes here so we follow through. Um, but um, I'm going to announce an immediate uh, prize winner. Uh, this is for the tw £20 um, Amazon voucher. 
Um, and then I'm going to announce two slightly more difficult ones to answer. Still pretty easy as part of the competition. So, um, but so bear me a second. Let me just uh, make sure I've got all my facts right because I don't want to get things wrong here because uh, there's a lot to this. Right, the person who's won a twenty-pound Amazon voucher, and uh, this was is although it's not a race. Um, one of the people did this in sort of record time in particular was, uh, bear me a second, let's check these timings again, make sure I'm making mistakes, um, was uh, David Blackler. So well done, David. Uh, you completed the diagnostic in four minutes and 27 seconds. Um, so very well done. So if you could um, very kindly email, uh, in a moment there'll be... Um, a chat box that, sorry, there'll be email, Mural's email address will come up in a moment. So if you just very kindly email address, email Mural, and also just let her know the email address you use for um, Amazon, which may well be different from your normal one, okay? Because what we'll do is we'll send you a 20 pound Amazon voucher electronically through the platform. Um, and there's a very close uh, runner up to that. And I'm because, Renato, you had a bit of an advantage on this, so uh, I'm slightly pleased you didn't win it on these grounds. <laughs> okay, but I've decided to give you, like, a, a, a prize for this. Um, first of all, you actually did get the highest score, but that I don't want to measure it by performance today, but you were within one second of what David did, so I feel that you also should get something out of today as well. So, Renato, there's a, a £20 Amazon voucher for you, um, again, let Mural know your uh, Amazon email address, which may be different from your uh, normal email address. Okay, so and now we've got two other prizes uh, to give away. So well done to both of you. Um, so two uh, other. So so it's Renato and David um, Blackler. Yeah, Blackler. and we've given Thomas uh, one for when he came on live stream. Oh, yes, Thomas, yes, and and of course Thomas, you won something. It won an Amazon voucher earlier on, so. Again, just email Mural um, at the end of this call and uh, let her know your Amazon address. Now, the two questions I've got for you, and this is going to be based on speed. Now, Mural, this is going to be slightly tricky for you, actually, because we, we've got a slight problem here because several of you have joined via YouTube and others have joined by Facebook, and there's a timing issue because one platform falls slightly behind the other because this is going to be based on speed. Have you got both tabs open on YouTube and Facebook? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, if there is a tie with this or it's unclear, we'd need to split the voucher between the two of you, okay? Because we did have a, a situation where we tried to do this a few months ago and we hadn't built in the fact that one platform follows 20 seconds behind the other. Um, so, have you got both tabs open right now, Miral? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because uh, we, we won't be able to just go by what's in here because it probably won't be quick enough. Um, okay, so the question, to, this is for the... Another £20 down was about to them. We've got the £50 one coming um, up from that. Uh, now, in the this is this is the question number one for a £20 Amazon prize. Is how many messages did I say were the optimal number of messages part of the uh, uh, messaging process through LinkedIn to maximize the sales-based opportunities coming through? So the person who comes up with the number there, and if it's a tie. I may have to ask a secondary question relating to that. Um, so how, how many messages uh, do we recommend as a minimum for the optimized messaging process through LinkedIn? Okay, so put in your number in the chat, okay, and um, we will go from there. Now, the, the, obviously, you can do as many messages as you like, um, but there was an optimum figure I mentioned as a, minim as a minimum. So, okay, so I can see loads of results coming in now. Uh, Tom, oh, Tom did recorrect himself there. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, I'll give everyone about another 30 seconds, just put their answers in, just in case there's a time lag on the platforms. <laughs> oh, I, lo I love it. So, a bit of friendly competition here. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Miro, give it another 15 seconds to see whether we can narrow this down. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, right. The 
answer to this question is five. I, I did say that if you want to do a six or seven message process, that's even better. But there's a, an optimum number as a minimum we'd recommend is actually five. Okay. Now, the Miro, can you just check with Alan Lavender and um, in particular what time he came in out against uh, anyone else? <laughs> it doesn't actually give a time, Rupert. Right. Uh, it doesn't yeah. give a time, but um, looking at the way the answer came through here, it was well in advance of Tom's. Yeah, okay. It's a clear winner here, I think, Alan, and pleased to say you actually won the £20 Amazon voucher, so very well done on this. Um, Tom, you had two guesses there. I'm not quite sure if we would allow that anyway, uh, but uh, in any event, uh, well done, Alan. You were the clear winner. There is, as I say, a bit of a time lag between the platforms. That's why I had to do like a double check. Uh, now, the other part, it, this is the, for the £50 prize. Okay, so this is the final, top prize. Um, when I talked about Amplify Your Brand, I described there being multiple parts of that. So we talked about creating video content and live streams as being one of them. Then I went around the other modules that you get as part of that as part of the amplify your brand package this is excluding what you might get as part of the easy start one and there was um a certain number of modules in there so can you all guess or, or remember what was that number of modules that you actually got as part of that amplify your brand package yeah so well done so trying to just a case of guessing a number. And again, there is a time lag in this. Um, I think it takes 20 seconds to stream from here. I think sometimes Facebook is a bit quite quicker than YouTube. Um, and then it might time to take another 15 seconds for people on YouTube to win it. So this is why we have this slight timing thing we have to be careful of. Um, so anyone got in there first? Okay, so we'll give everyone about another minute or so. Just make sure we're playing fair here. Amira, I've been quite clear of my question, have I? Uh, yeah, for me, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, right. Okay. So this is never wrecking. This is open to clients, by the way. I should have perhaps said that earlier on. So, uh, but uh, hopefully you've had a bash anyway. So if you do come up with the answers there. Right. <laughs> Okay, so we'll give another 30 seconds for everyone to respond. Okay. Um, actually, no one at the moment has got the answer right. So, <coughs> so the first person to get the correct answer, again, that got to allow for the time lag in the here, then let's give um, everyone another chance to get the correct answer. Okay, so who's going to come in with the correct answer first? This is nerve wracking. <laughs> I'm nervous for you. <laughs> right, I'll uh, give everyone another 30 seconds. <laughs> right. Miro, you've got both tabs open and YouTube, Facebook again. You're going to have to look at the tabs in here. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, God, how are we going to work this out? M Miro, if I said to you the answer was eight, which is the correct answer, um, is a toss-up between Tom Brown and Alan again. Okay. I, I would say Tom because I had both tabs open and Tom definitely typed it in before Alan did, I'm yeah. afraid. So this is not look, looking at um, uh, the streaming platform. It's literally looking in the social channels itself, is it? It's actually looking at Facebook and, and um, YouTube. Yeah. Tom, Tom, you, by a wing and a prayer, you got that one. <laughs> so, so, so well done. Okay, so that's a £50 uh, Amazon voucher for you. So just email uh, Mural um, after this session today uh, with the correct, make sure you give us the correct email address because we don't want to put it in someone else's account. Okay, 
Um, so well done on that. Um, Alan, very close there. In fact, on my screen here, it looks you were ahead of um, Tom by about a second. But then we do know there's a delay. So this is why I had to ask Mural to what, keep an eye on both streams. Um, right, so we've got just two more slides and we've got a, it's pretty well a wrap. So, um, <laughs> okay, lovely. Good. So first of all, has everyone enjoyed today? Has everyone got lots of value out of it? Have they really enjoyed today? Just type in yes, or put a thumbs up or whatever you want to do. It's always nice to have uh, feedback from you guys. Um, and uh, two more slides and it's a, a wrap. So we have finished a bit ahead of time. Um, so this Thursday, um, we just for those of you who are not regulars of this, um, every Thursday we want to run a live stream, which uh, we start at five minutes earlier, <clears throat> but five o'clock GMT. Okay, and um, it's a weekly live stream. It's about sharing value. Um, and this week we're interviewing uh, Ian Randall, and he's going to be talking about suffering with overwhelm. Make 2021 your year uh, for growth. Okay. Now, that's quite a challenge because also I know last year his business was affected to a degree, but he's, he was able to um, to pivot a little bit with part of his business, and uh, that works very well for him. So it should be a really interesting interview. Uh, now, next week um, is actually a double session because once a month we have a double session. So we have the normal weekly live stream, and um, but next week it's preceded by a networking collaboration event. It's on a different platform. OK, and it's uh, those of you who are familiar with um, uh, Remo, for example, it creates almost like a virtual table experience. Um, so it's a, a good fun experience. Um, we'd recommend coming at 3.45. You, it officially doesn't start for another 15 minutes. But what we're finding is a lot of people actually really like the networking collaboration part, the very early part. So we used to start this at four. We started 15 minutes earlier. And then what will happen is we will break people down into individual virtual tables and we'll debate a particular point which will revolve around the topic of how to simulate business growth as an entrepreneur. And that will be the follow-on session as part of the live stream. So 3.45, there's a networking collaboration session. It'll be a chance to network. You will then workshop as part of a little bit of some groups in terms of some questions, typically two or three questions are then fed into the live stream, which starts at five o'clock. So we recommend you taking part in both, if you can. And the way you actually get to that, again, very easily, is if you go to the businessgrowthbureau.tv uh, website, then choose the events drop down and look for live streams. Um, and you'll be able to book there. Now, it'll, this week, it's time around, it'll actually show only tomorrow's but obviously once, uh, not tomorrow, because it's Tuesday, um, on, th on Thursday we'll update it. Uh, but you can actually book, but uh, you can also book as a recurring event. So you can book like um, one session, uh, sorry, you can, or, or equally, you can choose the, re the uh, recurring option. It allows you to book multiple weeks. Um, now, all of those of you, I'll just remind you as well, because obviously of Christmas in between, we, had to, uh, we didn't run a session on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve as you'd expect. Uh, you may need to find you need to recreate your booking again. But uh, uh, anyway, so do register for that if you would like to do so. And uh, uh, finally, in passing, if you would like to message uh, myself or Mural after today, these are our contact details. Um, there are my phone, my phone number and Mural's number. And that's our we use the .com domain for, at the moment for our email address, which is in the process of migrating our uh, email accounts. Um, so Rupert at businessgrowthbureau.com or Mural. Uh, businessgrowthbureau.com and uh, for bookings or anything on the website just choose the businessgrowthbureau.tv okay uh, we have got a slight minor problem in the short term because um, we only made this migration over last weekend we got a slight problem with the security certificate um, so if you do go to the .com website by mistake you may get a google warning temporarily um, you can either just ignore it and continue and it'll, it'll take you through the .tv or just type the .tv part um, directly. We'll hopefully have that resolved next couple of days, but it's a bit involved over getting the certificates reissued and things like that. Um, anyway, so I want to just say thank you very much indeed for taking part today. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as we had and you've hopefully got lots of value out of today. So thank you very much indeed. Um, really looking forward to speaking with you. If you haven't booked a call in yet, do book a call in. Miral and myself will be very Please have a conversation. So have, have a lovely uh, evening, everyone. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll see you very soon. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.